The Trials of Rumpole by John Mortimer Rumpole and the Man of God As I take up my pen during a brief and unfortunate lull in crime, taking their cue from the car workers, the villains of this city appear to have downed tools, causing a regrettable series of layoffs, redundancies, and slow-time workings down the old valley. I wonder which of my most recent trials to chronicle... Sitting in chambers on a quiet Sunday morning, I never write these memories at home for fear that she who must be obeyed, my wife Hilda, should glance over my shoulder and take exception to the manner in which I have felt it right in the strict interests of truth and accuracy to describe domestic life, a côté de chez Rampol. Uh, seated, as I say, in my chambers, I thought of going to the archives and consulting the mementos of some of my more notorious victories. However, when I opened the cupboard, it was bare, and I remembered that it was during my defence of a South London clergyman on a shoplifting rap that I had felt bound to expunge all traces of my past and destroy my souvenirs. It is the curse as well as the fascination of the law that lawyers get to know more than is good for them about their fellow human beings— and this truth was driven home to me during the time that I was engaged in the affair that I have called Rumpole and the Man of God. When I was called to the bar too long ago now for me to remember with any degree of comfort, I may have had high-flown ideas of a general practice of a more or less lush variety, divorcing duchesses, defending stars of stage and screen from imputations of unchastity, getting shipping companies out of scrapes. But I soon found that it's crime which not only pays moderately well, but which is also by far the greatest fun. Give me a murder on a spring morning with a decent run and a tolerably sympathetic jury, and Rumpel's happiness is complete. Like most decent advocates, I have no great taste for the law. But I flatter myself I can cross-examine a copper on his notebook or charm the Uxbridge magistrates off their bench, or have the old darling sitting number four in the jury box sighing with pity for an embezzler with two wives and six starving children. I am also, and I say it with absolutely no desire to boast, about the best man in the temple on the subject of bloodstains. There's really nothing you can tell Rumpel about blood, particularly when it's out of the body and onto the clothing in the forensic laboratory. The old head of my chambers, C. H. Whiston, now deceased, also known reluctantly to me as Daddy, being the father of Hilda Whiston, whom I married after an absent-minded proposal at an inns of court ball. Hilda now rules the Rumpel Roost, and rejoices in the dread title of She Who Must Be Obeyed. <clears throat> old C. H. Whiston, as I say, simply couldn't stand bloodstains. He even felt queasy looking at the photographs, so I started by helping him out with his criminal work and soon won my spurs round the London sessions, Bow Street, and the Old Bailey. By the time I was called on to defend this particular cleric, I was so well known in the Ludgate Circus Palais de Justice that many people, to my certain knowledge, called Horace Rumpole an Old Bailey hack. I am now famous for chain-smoking small cigars and for the resulting avalanche of ash which falls down the waistcoat and smothers the watch-chain, for my habit of frequently quoting from the Oxford Book of English Verse, and for my fearlessness in front of the more savage types of circuit judge. I fix the old darlings with my glittering eye and whisper, Down, Fido, when they grow overexcited. Picture me, then, in my late sixties, well nourished on a diet consisting largely of pub lunches, steak and kidney pud, and the cooking claret from Pomeroy's Wine Bar in Fleet Street, which keeps me astonishingly regular. My reputation stands very high in the remand wing of Brixton Nick, where many of my regular clients, fraudsmen, petermen, safe blowers to you, 
break us in and carriers of offensive weapons smile with everlasting hope when their solicitors breathe the magic words, We are taking in Horace Rumpel. I remember walking through the temple gardens to my chambers one late September morning with the pale sun on the roses and the first golden leaves floating down on the young solicitors' clerks and their girlfriends, and I was in a moderately expansive mood. Morning was at seven, or rather around nine forty-five. The hillside was undoubtedly dew-pearled, God was in his heaven, and with a little luck there was a small crime or two going on somewhere in the world. As soon as I got into the clerk's department of my chambers at number three equity court, Erskine Brown said, Rumpel, I saw a priest going into your room. Our clerk's room was as busy as Paddington Station, with our young and energetic clerk, Henry, sending barristers rushing off to distant destinations. Erskine Brown, in striped shirt, double-breasted waistcoat, and what I believe are known as Chelsea boots, was propped up against the mantelpiece, reading the particulars of some building claim Henry had just given him. "'Ah, oh, that's your con, Mr. Rumpole,' said Henry, explaining the curious manifestation of a holy man. "'Your conversion! Ha! Have you seen the light, Rumpole? Is number three equity court your road to Damascus?' "'I cannot care for Erskine Brown, especially when he makes what he fondly imagines to be jokes. I chose to ignore this and go to the mantelpiece to collect my brief, where I found old Uncle Tom, T.C. Rowley, the oldest member of our chambers, who looks in because almost anything is preferable to life with his married sister in Croydon. Oh, dear, said Uncle Tom, a vicar in trouble. I suppose it's the choir boys again. I always think the church runs a terrible risk having choir boys. They'd be far safer with a lot of middle-aged lady sopranos. I had slid the pink tape off the brief and was getting the gist of the clerical slip-up when Miss Trant, the bright young Portia of Equity Court, if Portia's now have rimmed specks and speak with a Rodine accent, said that she didn't think vicars were exactly my line of country. Of course they're my line of country, I told her with delight. Anyone accused of nicking half a dozen shirts is my line of country. I had gone through the brief instructions by this time. It seems that the cleric in question was called by the somewhat Arthurian name of the Reverend Mordred Skinner. He'd gone to the summer sales in Oxford Street, a scene of carnage and rapine in which no amount of gold would have persuaded Rumpel to participate, had been let off the leash in the gent's haberdashery and later apprehended in the Hall of Food with a pile of moderately garish shirtings for which he hadn't paid. Having spent a tough ten minutes digesting the facts of this far from complex matter, well, it showed no signs of becoming a state trial or House of Lords material, I set off in the general direction of my room, but on the way I was met by my old friend George Frobisher, exuding an almost audible smell of bay rum or some similar unguent. I am not myself against a little eau de cologne on the handkerchief, but the idea of any sort of cosmetic on my friend George was like finding a bishop en travesti or saucy seaside postcards on sale in the vestry. George is an old friend, a dear good fellow, a gentle soul who stands up in court with all the confidence of a sacrificial virgin waiting for the sunrise over Stonehenge, but a dab hand at the time's crossword and a companionable fellow for a drink after court in Pomeroy's wine bar off Fleet Street. I was surprised to see he appeared to have a new suit on, a silvery tie and a silk bandana peeping from his top pocket. You haven't forgotten about tonight, have you? George asked anxiously. We're going off for a bottle of Chateau Fleet Street in Pomeroy's. Uh, no, no, I'm bringing a friend to dinner with you and Hilda. I had to confess that this social engagement had slipped my mind. In any event, it seemed unlikely that anyone would wish to spend an evening with she who must be obeyed, unless they were tied to her by bonds of matrimony. But it seemed that George had invited himself some weeks before, and that he was keenly looking forward to the occasion. Ah, oh, no Pomeroy's, then. I felt cheated of the conviviality. No, but we might bring a bottle with us. 
I have a little news. I'd like you and Hilda to be the first to know. He stopped then, enigmatically, and I gave a pointed sniff at the perfume-laden haze about him. George, you haven't taken to brilliant teen by any chance. Oh, uh, we'll be there at seven-thirty. George smiled in a sheepish sort of fashion and went off whistling something that might have been mistaken for the Tennessee waltz if he happened to be turn deaf. I passed on to keep my rendezvous with the Reverend Mordred Skinner. The man of God came with his sister, Miss Evelyn Skinner, a brisk woman in sensible shoes, who had foolishly let him out of her sight in the haberdashery, and Mr. Morse, a grey-haired solicitor who did a lot of work with the church commissioners and whose idea of a thrilling trial was a gentle dispute about how many candles you can put over the high altar on the third Sunday in Lent. My client himself was a pale, timid individual who looked with watery eyes and a pinkish tinge to his nostrils as if he had caught a severe cold during his childhood and had never quite got over it. He also seemed puzzled by the mysteries of the universe, the greatest of which was the arrival of six shirts in the shopping bag he was carrying through the hall of food. I suggested that the whole thing might be explained by absent-mindedness. Those sales, I said, would induce panic in the hardiest housewife. Would they? Mordred stared at me. His eyes behind steel-rimmed glasses seemed strangely amused. I must say I found the scene lively and quite entertaining. Well, no doubt you took the shirts to the cash desk, meaning to pay for them. Uh, there were two assistants behind the counter. Uh, two young ladies to take money from customers, he said discouragingly. I mean, there was no need for me to take the shirts to any cash desk at all, Mr. Rumpel. I looked at the Reverend Mordred Skinner and relit the dying cheroot with some irritation. I am used to grateful clients, cooperative clients, clients who are willing to pull their weight and put their backs to the wheel in the great cause of victory for Rumpel. The many murderers I have known, for instance, have all been touchingly eager to help, and although one draws the line at simulated madness or futile and misleading alibis, at least such efforts show that the customer has a will to win. The cleric in my armchair seemed, by contrast, determined to put every possible obstacle in my way. I don't suppose you realize that, I told him firmly. You're hardly an habitué of the sales, are you? I expect you wandered off looking for a cash desk, and then your mind filled with next week's sermon, or whose turn it was to do the flowers in the chancel, or the whole mundane business of shopping simply slipped your memory. It is true, the Reverend Mordred admitted, that I, I was thinking a great deal at the time of the problem of evil. Oh, really? For the best will in the world, I didn't see how the problem of evil was going to help defence. What puzzles the ordinary fellow is, he frowned in bewilderment. If God is all-wise and perfectly good, why on earth did he put evil in the world? May I suggest an answer? I wanted to gain the poor cleric's confidence by showing him that I had no objection to a spot of theology so that an ordinary fellow like me can get plenty of briefs round the old Bailey in London sessions. Mordred considered the matter carefully and then expressed his doubts. No, 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 I can't think that's what he had in mind. It may seem a very trivial little case to you, Mr. Rumpole. Evelyn Skinner dragged us back from pure thought, but it's life and death to Mordred at which I stood and gave them all a bit of the rumple mind. A man's reputation is never trivial, I told them. I must beg you both to take it extremely seriously. Mr. Skinner, may I ask you to address your mind to one vital question? Given the fact that there were six shirts in the shopping basket you were carrying, how the hell did they get there? Mordred looked hopeless and said, I can't tell you. I, I prayed about it. Well, you think they might have leapt off the counter by the power of prayer? I mean, something like the loaves and fishes? Mr. Rumpel, Mordred smiled at me. Yours would seem to be an extremely literal faith. 
I thought that was a little rich coming from a man of such painful simplicity, so I lit another small cigar and found myself gazing into the hostile and somewhat fishy eyes of his sister. Are you suggesting, Mr. Rumpole, that my brother is guilty? Of course not, I assured her. Your brother's innocent. And he'll be so until twelve commonsensical old darlings picked at random off Newington Causeway find him otherwise. Uh, I rather thought a quick hearing before the magistrates with the least possible publicity. Mr. Morse showed his sad lack of experience in crime. A quick hearing before the magistrates, I said, is as good as pleading guilty. Uh, y you, you think we might win this case with the jury? I thought there was a faint flicker of interest in Mordred's pink-rimmed eyes. Juries are like almighty God, Mr. Skinner. Totally unpredictable. So the conference wound to an end without divulging any particular answer to the charge, and I asked Mordred to apply through his usual channels for some sort of defence when he was next at prayer. He rewarded this suggestion with a wintry smile. My visitors left me, just as she who must be obeyed came through on the blower to remind me that George was coming to dinner and bringing a friend, and would I buy two pounds of cooking apples at the tube station, and would I also remember not to loiter in Pomeroy's wine bar taking any sort of pleasure. As I put the phone down, I noticed that Miss Evelyn Skinner had filtered back into my room, apparently desiring a word with Rumpole alone. She started in a tone of pity. I don't think you quite understand, my brother. Oh, Miss Skinner. Yes, well, uh, I never felt totally at home with Vickers. I felt some sort of apology was in order. He's like a child in many ways. Oh, the Peter Pan of the pulpit. In a way, I'm two years older than Mordred. I've always had to look after him. He wouldn't have gone anywhere without me, Mr. Rumpole, simply nowhere. If I hadn't been there to deal with the parish council and to say the right things to the bishop, Mordred just never thinks about himself or what he's doing half the time. Well, you should have kept a better eye on him in the sales. Of course I should. I should have been watching him like a hawk every minute. I blame myself entirely. She stood there busily blaming herself. And then her brother could be heard calling her plaintively from the passage. I'm coming, dear. I'm coming at once, Evelyn said briskly, and was gone. I stood looking after her, smoking a small cigar, and remembering Hilaire Belloc's sound advice to helpless children. Always keep tight hold of nurse, for fear of finding something worse. George Frobisher brought a friend to dinner, and, as I had rather suspected when I got a whiff of George's perfume in the passage, the friend was a lady, or, as I think Hilda would have preferred to call her, a woman. Now, I must make it absolutely clear that this type of conduct was totally out of character in my friend George. He had an absolutely clean record so far as women were concerned. Oh, I imagine he had a mother— and I have heard him occasionally mutter about sisters. But George had been a bachelor as long as I had known him, returning from our convivial claret in Pomeroy's to the Royal Borough Hotel Kensington, where he had a small room, reasonable en pension terms, and coloured television after dinner in the residence lounge, seated in front of which device George would read his briefs, occasionally taking a furtive glance at some long-running serial of hospital life. Judge of my surprise, therefore, when George turned up to dinner at Casa Rumpel with a very feminine, albeit middle-aged lady indeed. Mrs. Ida Tempest, as George introduced her, came with some species of furry animal wreathed about her neck, whose eyes regarded me with a glassy stare as I prepared to help Mrs. Tempest to partially disrobe. The lady's own eyes were far from glassy, being twinkling and roguish in their expression. Mrs. Tempest had reddish hair, rather the colour of falsely glowing artificial coals on an electric fire piled on her head, 
what I believe is known as a Cupid's bow mouth in the trade, and the sort of complexion which makes you think that if you caught its owner a brisk slap, you would choke in the resulting cloud of white powder. Her skirt seemed too tight, and her heels too high for total comfort, but it could not be denied that Mrs. Ida Tempest was a cheerful and even a pleasant-looking person. George gazed at her throughout the evening with mingled admiration and pride. It soon became apparent that in addition to his lady friend, George had brought a plastic bag from some off-license containing a bottle of non-vintage Moet. Such things are more often than not the harbinger of alarming news. And sure enough, as soon as the pud was on the table, George handed me the bottle to cope with an announcement that he and Mrs. Ida Tempest were engaged to be married. "'clearly taking the view that this news should be a matter for congratulation. "'We wanted you to be the first to know,' George said proudly. "'Hilda smiled in a way that can only be described as brave, "'and further comment was postponed by the explosion of the warm moe. "'I filled everyone's glasses, and Mrs. Tempest reached with enthusiasm for the booze. "'Oh, I do love bubbly!' she said. I love the way it goes all tickly up the nose. Don't you, Hilda? We hardly get enough of it to notice. She who must be obeyed was in no celebratory mood that evening. I'd noticed during the feast that she clearly was not hitting it off with Mrs. Tempest. I therefore felt it incumbent on me to address the court. Well, then, if we're all filled up, I suppose it falls to me. Accustomed as I am to public speaking, I began the speech. Usually, on behalf of the criminal classes, Hilda grumbled. Yes, well, <clears throat> I think I know what is expected on these occasions. You mean, uh, you're like the film star's fifth husband. You know what's expected of you, but you don't know how to make it new. <laughs> It appeared from her giggles and George's proud smile that Mrs. Tempest had made a joke. Hilda was not amused. Well, then, I came to the peroration. Here's to the happy couple. Here's to us, George. George and Mrs. Tempest clinked glasses and twinkled at each other. We all took a mouthful of warmish gas. After which, Hilda courteously pushed the food in George's fiancée's direction. Would you care for a little more Charlotte Russe, Mrs. Tempest? Oh, Ida, please call me Ida. Well, just a teeny weeny scraping. I don't want to lose my sylph-like figure, do I, Georgie? Uh, otherwise you might not fancy me any more. There's no danger of that. The appalling thing was that George was looking roguish also. Of you not fancying me? Oh, I know. La Tempest simpered. I'm losing your figure, my dear. She's slim as a bluebell. Isn't she slim as a bluebell, Rumpel? George turned to me for corroboration. I answered cautiously. Oh, I suppose that depends rather on the size of the bluebell. Oh, Horace, you are terrible. Why have you been keeping this terrible man from me, George? Mrs. Tempest seemed delighted with my enigmatic reply. I hope we're going to see a lot of each other after we're married. George smiled round the table and got a small tightening of the lips from Hilda. Oh, yes, George, I'm sure that will be very nice. The tide had gone down in Mrs. Tempest's glass, and after I had topped it up, she held it to the light and said admiringly, Lovely glasses, so tasteful. Just look at that, George. Isn't that a lovely, tasteful glass? Uh, they're rejects, actually, Hilda told her, from the army and navy stores. What whim of providence was it that led you across the path of my old friend George Frobisher? I felt I had to keep the conversation going. Uh, Mrs. Tempest, that is, Ida, came as a guest to the Royal Borough Hotel. George started to talk shyly of romance. You noticed me, didn't you, dear? Mrs. Tempest was clearly cast in the position of prompter. I must admit I did. And I noticed him noticing me. You know how it is with men, don't you, Hilda? Sometimes I wonder if Rumpel notices me at all. 
Hilda struck, I thought, an unnecessarily gloomy note. Of course I notice you, I assured her. I come home in the evenings, and, 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 and there you are. There you are. I notice you all the time. As a matter of fact, we first spoke in the manageress's office, George continued with the narration, where we'd both gone to register a complaint on this question of bathwater. There's not enough to fill the valleys, I told her, let alone cover the hills. <laughs> Mrs. Tempest explained gleefully to Hilda, who felt apparently that no such explanation was necessary. And George agreed with me, didn't you, George? Um, shall I say, we formed an alliance. Ah, we hit it off at once, with so many interests in common. Really? I looked at Mrs. Tempest in some amazement. Apart from the basic business of keeping alive, I couldn't imagine what interest she had in common with my old friend George Frobisher. At which point Hilda rose firmly and asked George's intended if she wanted to powder her nose, which innocent question provoked a burst of giggles. <laughs> you mean, do I want to spend penny? <laughs> it is customary, said Hilda, with some hauteur, at this stage to leave the gentleman. Oh, you mean what a hand with washing up, Mrs. Tempest followed Hilda out, delivering her parting line to me. Not too many naughty stories now, Horace. I don't want you leading my George astray. At which I swear she winked. When we were left alone with a bottle of the old tawny, George was still gazing foolishly after the vanishing Ida. Charming, he said. Isn't she charming? Now, at this point, I became distinctly uneasy. I had been looking at La Belle Tempest with a feeling of déjà vu. I felt sure that I'd met her before, and not in some previous existence. And, of course, I was painfully aware of the fact that the vast majority of my social contacts are made in cells, courtrooms, and other places of not too good repute. I therefore answered cautiously, uh, your Mrs. Tempest seems to have a certain amount of vivacity. She's a very able businesswoman, too. Is she now? Yes, she used to run an hotel with her first husband. Highly successful business, apparently, somewhere in Kent. I frowned. The word hotel rang a distant but distinctly audible bell. So I thought, when we're married, of course, she might take up a small hotel again, in the West Country, perhaps. And what about you, George? Would you give up your work at the bar and devote all your time to the Valletta? I rather wanted to point out to him the difficulties of the situation. Well, I don't want to burst, but I thought I might go for a circuit judgeship. George said this shyly, as though disclosing another astonishing sexual conquest. In fact, I have applied. In some rural area. You a judge, George? A judge? Oh, well, come to think of it, it might suit you. You never were much good in court, were you, old darling? And George looked slightly puzzled at this, but I blundered on. It wasn't in Ramsgate, by any chance, was it? Where your uh, inamorata kept a small hotel? Oh, why, why do you ask? George was lapping up the port in a sort of golden reverie. Don't do it, George, I said. Loudly enough, I hoped to blast him out of his complacency. But don't be a judge. Don't get married. Oh, look, George. Your Honour, if your Lordship pleases, have a little consideration, my dear boy. I tried to appeal to his better nature. I mean, where would you be leaving me? Oh, very much as you are now, I should imagine. Those peaceful moments of the day, those hours we spend with a bottle of Chateau Fleet Street from 5.30 on in Pomeroy's wine bar, that wonderful oasis of peace that lies between the battle of the Bailey and the horrors of home life. You mean they'll be denied to me from now on? You mean we'll be, you'll be bolting like a rabbit down the temple underground back to Mrs. Tempest and leaving me without a companion? George looked at me thoughtfully and then gave judgment with, I thought, a certain lack of feeling. Well, I am, of course, extremely fond of you, Rumpel. 
but you're not exactly, um, well, not someone who can share all one's interests with. Don't do it, George. Marriage is like pleading guilty for an indefinite sentence without parole. I poured more port. You're exaggerating. I'm not, George. I swear by Almighty God, I'm not. I gave in the facts. Do you know what happens on Saturday mornings, when free men are lying in bed or wandering contentedly towards a glass of breakfast shabbly in a slow read of the obituaries? You'll both set out with the list, and your lady wife will spend your hard-earned money on things you have no desire to own, like vim and saucepan scarers and jay-cloths and mansion polish. And on your way home, you'll be asked to carry the shopping basket. Oh, I beg of you, don't do it. This plea to the jury might have had some effect, but the door then opened to admit La Belle Tempest. George's eyes glazed over, and he clearly became deaf to reason. And then Hilda entered and gave me a brisk order to bring in the coffee tray. She who must be obeyed, I whispered to George on my way out. Do you see what I mean, George? Uh, I might as well have saved my breath. He wasn't listening. On the following Monday, I went down to Dockside Magistrates Court to defend young Jim Timpson on a charge of taking and driving away a Ford Cortina. I have acted for various members of the clan Timpson, a noted breed of South London villains, for many years. They know the law and their courtroom behaviour, I mean the way they stand to attention and call the magistrate sir, is impeccable. I went into battle fiercely that afternoon, and it was a famous victory. We got the summons dismissed with costs against the police. I hoped I'd achieve the same happy result in the notable trial of the Reverend Mordred Skinner, but I very much doubted it. As soon as I was back in chambers, I opened a cupboard, sneezed in the resulting cloud of dust, and burrowed in the archives. I lingered briefly on a book of old press cuttings from the news of the world, that fine legal textbook in the criminal jurisdiction, and merely glanced at the analysis of bloodstains from the old Brick Lane billiard hall murder, when I was locked in single-handed combat on my Lord Chief Justice of England, and secured an acquittal, and came at last on what I was seeking. The blue folder of photographs was nestling under an old wig tin and an outdated work on forensic medicine. As I dug out my treasure and carried it to the light on my desk, I muttered a few lines of old William Wordsworth's The Sheep of the Lake District. Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow for old, unhappy, far-off things and battles long ago. On the cover of the photographs, I'd stuck a yellowed cutting from the Ramsgate Times. Couple charged in local arson case, I read again. The unexplained destruction of the Saracen's Head Hotel. I opened the folder. There was a picture of a building on the seafront, and a number of people standing around. I took the strong glass off my desk to examine the figures in the photograph, and saw the younger but still roguishly smiling face of Mrs. Ida Tempest, my friend George's intended. Having tucked the photographs back in the archive, I went straight to Pomeroy's wine bar. Nothing unusual about that. I rarely go anywhere else at six o'clock, after the day's work is done. But George wasn't in chambers, and I hoped he might drop in there for a strengthener before a night of dalliance with his enamorata at the Royal Borough Hotel. However, when I got to Pomeroy's, the only recognisable figure, apart from a few mournful-looking journalists and the opera critic in residence, was our Portia, Miss Phyllida Trant, drinking a lonely Cinzano Bianco with ice and lemon. She told me she hadn't seen George and said rather enigmatically that she was waiting for a person called Claude, who on further inquiry turned out to be none other than our elegant expert on the civil side, my learned antagonist Erskine Brown. Good God, is he Claude? Ah, makes me feel quite fond of him. Why are you waiting for him? Do you want to pick his brains on the law of mortgages? 
We are by way of being engaged, Miss Trant said somewhat sharply. Infection seemed to be spreading in our chambers like jippy tummy. I looked at Miss Trant and asked simply for information. You sure you know enough about him? I am afraid I do, she sounded resigned. I mean, you'd naturally want to know everything, wouldn't you? About anyone you're going to commit matrimony with? I wanted her confirmation. Go on, surprise me. Miss Trant, I had the feeling, was not being entirely serious. He married a middle-aged Persian contortionist when he was up at Keeble. Oh, I'd love to know that. It'd make him far more exciting. At which point the beloved Claude actually made his appearance in a bowler and overcoat with a velvet collar, and announced he had some treat in store for Miss Trant, such as Verdi's Requiem in the Festival Hall, while she looked at him as though disappointed at the unmurkiness of the Erskine Brown past. And then I saw George at the counter making a small purchase from Jack Pomeroy, and I bore down on him. I had no doubt at that stage that my simple duty to my old friend was immediate disclosure. However, when I reached George, I found that he was investing in a bottle far removed from our usual Chateau Fleet Street. Oh, 1967, Pichon Longueville. Celebrating, George? Yes, in a way. We have a glass or two in the room now. Can't get anything decent in the restaurant. George was storing the nectar away in his briefcase with the air of a practised boulevardier. Uh, George, look, my dear fellow, um, look, will you have a drink? It's really much more comfortable up in the room, George babbled on regardless. And we listened to the BBC Overseas Service, old Victor Sylvester records requested from Nigeria. <laughs> they only seem to care for ballroom dancing in the third world nowadays. My old friend was moving away from me, although I did all I could to stop him. Uh, please, George, it'll only take a minute. Look, um, um uh, something you, you really ought to know. Uh, sorry to desert you, Rumpold, and never do to keep Ida waiting. And he was gone, as Jack Pomeroy, with his purple face and the rosebud in his buttonhole, asked what was my pleasure. Red Plonk, I told him, Chateau Fleet Street, a large glass. I've got nothing to celebrate. After that, I found it increasingly difficult to break the news to George, although I knew I had to do so. The Reverend Mordred Skinner was duly sent for trial at the Inner London Sessions, Newington Causeway, in the southeast corner of London. Wherever civilization ends, it is, I've always felt, somewhere just north of the Inner London Sessions. It's a strange thing, but I always look forward with a certain eagerness to an appearance at the Old Bailey. I walk down Newgate Street as often as not with a spring in my stride, and there it is in all its glory, a stately law court decreed by the city fathers, an Edwardian palace with a modern extension to deal with the increase in human fallibility. Terrible things go on down the Bailey, horrifying things. Why is it I never go through its revolving door without a thrill of pleasure, a slight tremble of excitement? Why does it seem a much jollier place than my flat in Gloucester Road under the strict rule of she who must be obeyed? But such pleasurable sensations, I must confess, are never connected with my visits to the inner London sessions. While a hint of spring sunshine often touches the figure of justice on the dome of the bailey, it always seems to be a wet Monday in November at Inner London. The Sessions House is stuck in a sort of urban desert down the old Kent Road, with nowhere to go for a decent bit of steak and kidney pud during the lunch hour. It's a sad sort of court, with all the cheeky cockney sparrows turned into silent figures waiting for the burglary to come on in court too. And the juries there look as if they relied on the work to eke out their social security. I met the reverend gentleman after I had donned the formal dress. Yellowing wig bought second-hand from an ex-attorney general of Tonga in 1932. Somewhat frayed gown, collar like a blunt extension. He seemed unconcerned and was even smiling a little. 
although his sister Evelyn looked like one about to attend a burning at the stake. Mr. Morse looked thoroughly uncomfortable, and as if he'd like to get back to a nice discussion of the almshouse charity in Chipping Sodbury. I tried to instill a suitable sense of the solemnity of the occasion in my clerical customer by telling him that God, with that wonderful talent for practical joking which has shown itself throughout recorded history, had dealt us his honour, Judge Bullingham. Uh, is he very dreadful? Mr. Skinner asked, almost hopefully. Why he was ever made a judge is one of the unsolved mysteries of the universe. I was determined not to sound reassuring. I can only suppose that his unreasoning prejudice against all black persons, defence lawyers, and probation officers comes from some deep psychological cause. Perhaps his mother, if such a person can be imagined, was once assaulted by a black probation officer who was on his way to give evidence for the defence. I wonder how he feels about Parsons. My client seemed not at all put out. Oh, God knows, I rather doubt if he's ever met one. The bull's leisure taste runs to strong drink and all in wrestling. Come along, we might as well enter the corrida. A couple of hours later, his honour, Judge Bullingham, with his thick neck and complexion of a beetroot past its first youth, was calmly exploring his inner ear with his little finger, and tolerantly allowing me to cross-examine a large gentleman named Pratt, resident Flatfoot at the Oxford Street Bazaar. Mr. Pratt, how long have you been a detective in this particular store? Uh, ten years, sir. And before that? I was with the Metropolitan Police. Why did you leave? Uh, pay and conditions, sir, were hardly satisfactory. Oh, really? You found it more profitable to keep your beady eye on the ladies' lingerie counter than to do battle in the streets with serious crime? Are you suggesting that this isn't a serious crime, Mr. Rumpel? The learned judge who popped the villains with all the subtlety of his namesake animal charging a gate growled this question at me with his face going a darker purple than ever and his jowls trembling. For many people, my lord, I turned to the jury and gave them the message. Six shirts might be a mere triviality. For the Reverend Mordred Skinner, they represent the possibility of total ruin, disgrace, and disaster. In this case, my client's whole life hangs in the balance. I turned a flattering gaze on the twelve honest citizens who had been chosen to pronounce on the sanctity or otherwise of the Reverend Mordred. That is why we must cling to our most cherished institution, trial by jury. It is not the value of the property stolen. It is the priceless matter of a man's good reputation. Mr. Rumble, the bull lifted his head as if for the charge. You should know your business by now. This is not the time for making speeches. You will have an opportunity at the end of the case. And as your honour will have an opportunity after me to make a speech, I thought it well to make clear who the judges of fact in this matter are. I continue to look at the jury with an expression of flattering devotion. Yes, you very well get on with it. The bull retreated momentarily. I rubbed in the victory. Certainly that is what I was attempting to do. I turned to the witness. Mr. Pratt, when you were in the gent's haberdashery... Yes, sir. You didn't see my client remove the shirts from the counter and make off with them? No, sir. If he had, no doubt he would have told us about it. Bullingham could not resist growling. I gave him a little bow. Your Honour is always so quick to notice points in favour of the defence. I went back to work on the store detective. So why did you follow my client? The supervisor noticed a pile of shirts missing. She said there was a reverend been turning them over, Your Honour. This titbit delighted the bull, who snatched at it greedily. He might not have told us that if you hadn't asked the wrong question, Mr. Rumpel. No question is wrong if it reveals the truth, I informed the jury, and then turned back to Pratt. 
I had an idea, an uncomfortable feeling, that I might just have guessed the truth of this peculiar case. So you don't know if he was carrying the shopping basket when he left the shirt department? Uh, no. Was he carrying it when you first spotted him on the moving staircase? Uh, I only saw his head and shoulders. The pieces were fitting together. I would have to face my client with my growing notion of a defence as soon as possible. So you first saw him with the basket in the hall of food? That's right, sir. At which point Bullingham stirred dangerously and raised the curtain of his top lip on some large yellowing teeth. He was about to make a joke. Are you suggesting, Mr. Rumbo, that a basket full of shirts mysteriously materialized in your client's hand in the tinder meat department? <laughs> At which the jury laughed obsequiously. Rumbo silenced them in a voice of enormous gravity. Might I remind your honor of what he said? This is a serious case. As you cross-examined, Mr. Rumpel, I was beginning to wonder. <laughs> Bullingham was still grinning. The art of cross-examination, Your Honor, is a little like walking a tightrope. Oh, is it? Yes, one gets on so much better if one isn't continually interrupted. At which Bullingham relapsed into a sullen silence, and I got on with the work in hand. It would have been quite impossible for Mr. Skinner to have paid at the shirt counter, wouldn't it? Uh, no, sir, there were two assistants behind the counter. Young ladies? Yes, sir. When you saw them, what were they doing? Uh, I, uh, I can't exactly recall. Well, then, let me jog your memory. Here I made an informed guess at what any two young lady assistants would be doing at the height of business during the summer sales. Were they not huddled together in an act of total recall of last night in the disco or palais de hop? Were they not blind and deaf to the cries of shirt-buying clerics? Were they not utterly oblivious to the life around them? The jury was looking at me and smiling, and some of the ladies nodded understandingly. I could feel that the old darlings knew all about young lady non-assistants in Oxford Street. Well, Mr. Pratt, isn't that exactly what they were doing? It may have been, Your Honour. So is it surprising that my client took his purchase and went off in search of some more attentive assistants? But I followed him downstairs and to the hall of food. Have you any reason to suppose he wouldn't have paid for his shirts there, given the slightest opportunity? I saw no sign of his attempting to do so. Just as you saw no sign of the sales ladies attempting to take his money. No, but uh, it's a risky business entering your store, isn't it, Pratt? I put it to him. You can't get served, and no one speaks to you except to tell you that you're under arrest. I sat down to some smiles from the jury and a glance from the bull. An eager young man named Ken Rydell was prosecuting. I had run up against this Rydell, a ginger-haired, bespectacled wonder who might once have been a senior scout and won the Duke of Edinburgh Award for being left out on the mountainside for a week. Ken felt a strong sense of team spirit and loyalty to the Metropolitan Police and he was as keen as mustard to add the Reverend Mordred Skinner to the notches on his woggle. Uh, did you see Mr. Skinner make any attempt to pay for his shirts in the Hall of Food? Ken asked Pratt. I read a note from my client that had finally arrived by way of the usher. But no, no, I didn't, said Pratt. Ken was smiling, about to make a little scout-like funny. He didn't ask for them to be wrapped up with a pound of ham, for instance. No, sir. Pratt laughed and looked round the court to see that no one else was laughing, and the bull was glaring at Ken. This is not a music hall, Mr. Rydell. As Mr. Rumpel has reminded us, this is an extremely serious case. The whole of the reverend gentleman's future is at stake. The judge glanced at the clock as if daring it not to be time for lunch. The clock cooperated.
and the bull rose, muttering, Ten past two, members of the jury. I crumpled my client's note with some disgust and threw it on the floor as I stood to bow to the bull. The Reverend Mordred had just told me he wasn't prepared to give evidence in his own defence. I would have to get him on his own and twist his arm a little. I simply couldn't take the oath, he told me later. What's the matter with you? Have you no religion? The cleric smiled politely and said, less as a question than a statement of fact, You don't like me very much, do you? We were sitting in one of the brighter hostelries in Newington Causeway. The bleak and sour-smelling saloon bar was sparsely populated by two ailing cleaning ladies drinking stout, Another senior citizen who was smoking the dog ends he kept in an old oxo tin and exercising his talent as a coffer for England, and a large drunk in a woolly bubble hat who kept banging in and out of the gents with an expression of increasing euphoria. I had entrusted to Mr. Morse, the solicitor, the tricky task of taking Miss Evelyn Skinner to lunch in the public canteen at the Sessions House. I imagined he'd get the full blast of her anxiety over the grey, unidentifiable meat and two veg. Meanwhile, I had whisked the reverend out to the pub, where he sat with the intolerably matey expression vicars always assume in licensed premises. I felt you might tell me the truth. You, of all people. Having a collar on back to front must mean something. Truth is often dangerous. It must be approached cautiously, don't you think? My client bit nervously into a singularly unattractive sausage. I tried to approach the matter cautiously. I've noticed with women, I told him, with my wife, for instance, when we go out on our dreaded Saturday morning shopping expeditions, that she who must be obeyed is in charge of the shopping basket. She makes the big decisions, how much vim goes in it and so forth. When the shopping's bought, I get the job of carrying the damn thing home. Simple faith is far more important than the constant scramble after unimportant facts. Mordred was back on the old theology. I believe that's what the lives of the saints tells us. Enough of this cathedral gossip. We were due back in court in half an hour, and I let him have it between the eyes. Well, my simple faith tells me that your sister had the basket in the shirt department. Oh, does it? He blinked most of the time, but not then. When Pratt saw you in the hall of food, you were carrying the shopping basket, which she'd handed to you on the escalator. Uh, perhaps. Because she had taken the shirts and put them in the bag when you were too busy composing your sermon on the problem of evil to notice. I lit a small cigar at that point, and Mordred took a sip of sour bitter. He was still smiling as he started to talk, almost shyly at first, and then with increasing confidence. She was a pretty child. It's difficult to believe it now. She was always attracted to bright things, boiled sweet, red apples, jewellery and Woolworths. As she grew older, it became worse. She would take things she couldn't possibly need. Spectacles, bead handbag, cigarette cases, although she never smoked. She was like a magpie. I thought she'd improved. I try to watch her as much as I can, although you're right. On that day, I was involved with my sermon. As a matter of fact, I had no need of such shirts. I may be old-fashioned, but I always wear a dog collar, always. Even on rambles with the lads' brigade. All the same, my client said firmly. I believe she did it out of love. Well, now we had a defence. Although he didn't seem to be totally aware of it. Those are the facts... They seem to be of no interest to anyone, except my immediate family. But that's what I'm bound to say, if I take my oath on the Bible. But you were prepared to lie to me, I reminded him. He smiled again, that small, maddening smile. Mr. Rumpole, I have the greatest respect for your skill as an advocate. But I have never been in danger of mistaking you for Almighty God. 
Look, tell the truth now. She'll only get a fine. Nothing. He seemed to consider the possibility, and then he shook his head. No, uh, to her it would be everything. She couldn't bear it. Now what about you? You'd give up your whole life. It seems the least I can do for her. He was smiling again, hanging that patient little grin out like an advertisement for his humility and his deep sense of spiritual superiority to a worldly old Bailey hack. I ground out my small cigar in the overflowing ashtray and almost shouted, Good God, I don't know how I keep my temper. Yes, I do sympathize. He found his ideas irritated people dreadfully, particularly lawyers. He was almost laughing now. But you do understand, I'm quite unable to give evidence on oath to the jury. As every criminal lawyer knows, it's very difficult to get a client off unless he's prepared to take the trouble of going into the witness box to face up to the prosecution and to demonstrate his innocence, or at least his credentials, as a fairly likable character who might buy you a pint after work, and whom you would not really want to see festering in the nick. After all, fair's fair. The jury have just seen the prosecution witnesses put through it, so why should the prisoner at the bar sit in solemn silence in the dock? I knew that if the Reverend told his story with suitable modesty and regret— I could get him off, and Evelyn would merely get a well-earned talking to. When he refused to give evidence, I could almost hear the rustle of unfrocking in the distance. Short of having my clan dragged to the Bible by a sturdy usher, when he would no doubt stand mute of malice, there was nothing I could do other than address the jury, in the unlikely hope of persuading them that there was no reliable evidence on which they could possibly convict the silent vicar. I was warming to my work as Bullingham sat inert, breathing hoarsely, apparently about to erupt. Members of the jury, I told them, there is a golden thread that runs throughout British justice. The prosecution must prove its case. The defense has to prove nothing. Mr. Rumble. The sound came from the judge like the first rumble they once heard from Mount Vesuvius. I sold it on. The Reverend Mordred Skinner need not trouble to move four yards from that dock to the witness box unless the prosecution has produced evidence that he intended to steal and not to pay in another department. Mr. Rumble. The earth tremor grew louder. I raised my voice a semitone. Never let it be said that a man is forced to prove his innocence. Our fathers have defied kings for that principle, members of the jury. They forced King John to sign Magna Carta and sent King Charles to the scaffold, and it has been handed down even to the inner London sessions Newington Causeway. If you let me get a word in edgeways, and now it is in your trust. I'm not, as this narrative may have made clear, a religious man. But what happened next made me realize how the Israelites felt when the waters divided, and understand the incredulous reaction of the disciples when an uninteresting glass of water flushed darkly and smelt of the grape. I can recall the exact words of the indubitable miracle. Bullingham said, Mr. Rumpole, I entirely agree with everything you say. And, he added, glowering threateningly at the scout for the prosecution, I shall direct the jury accordingly. The natural malice of the bull had been quelled by his instinctive respect for the law. He found that there was no case to answer. I met my liberated client in the gents, the place where his sister was unable to follow him. As we stood side by side at the porcelain, I congratulated him. Oh, I was quite reconciled to losing. I don't think my sister would have stood by me somehow. The disgrace, you see. I think, he looked almost wistful, I think I should have been alone. You'd have been unfrocked. It might have been extremely restful, 
not to have to pretend to any sort of sanctity, not to pretend to be different, to be exactly the same as everybody else. I looked at him standing there in the London Sessions loo, his mac over his arm, his thin neck half strangled by a dog collar. He longed for the relaxed life of an ordinary sinner, but he had no right to it. Don't long for a life of crime, old darling, I told him. You've obviously got no talent for it. Upstairs we met Evelyn and Mr. Morse. The sister gave me a flicker of something which might have been a smile of gratitude. It was a miracle, I told her. Really? I thought the judge was exceedingly fair. Come along, Mordred. He's somewhere else, you know, Mr. Rumpel. He can't even realize it's all over. She attacked her brother again. Better put your Mac on, dear. It's raining outside. Yes, Evelyn, yes, yes, I'll put it on. He did so obediently. You must come to tea in the rectory, Mr. Rumpel. I had a final chilly smile from Evelyn. Ah, uh, alas, dear lady, the pressure of work these days I have so little time uh, for pleasure. Say good-bye to Mr. Rumpel, Mordred. The cleric shook my hand and gave me a confidential aside. Good-bye, Mr. Rumpel. You see, it was entirely a family matter. There was no need for anyone to know anything about it. And so he went, in his sister's charge, back to the isolation of the rectory. Will no one tell me what she sings? Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow for old, unhappy, far-off things, and murders long ago. Had I, against all the odds, learned something from the reverend? Was I now more conscious of the value of secrecy, of not dropping bombs of information which might cause ruin and havoc on the family front? It seems unlikely, but I do not know why else I was busily destroying the archive, pushing the photographs into the unused fireplace in my chambers and applying a match, and dropping the durable articles, including the ostrich egg, into the waste paper basket. As the flames licked across the paper and set Mrs. Tempest, the arsonist, curling into ashy oblivion, the door opened to admit Miss Trant. Rumper, what on earth are you doing? I turned from the smoking relics. You keep things, Miss Trant. Mementos, locks of hair, old letters tied up in ribbon. Memories, I started to sing tunelessly, were made of this. No, not really. Good. Oh, but I've kept my first brief from when I prosecuted you in Dock Street. This was the occasion when I tricked Miss Trant into boring the wretched beak with a huge pile of law, and so defeated her. Uh, it was not an incident of which I am particularly proud. Destroy it. Forget the past, eh, Miss Trant? Look to the future. Yes, all right. Aren't you coming up to Guthrie Featherson's room? We're laying on a few drinks for George. George? Oh, yes, of course. He'll have a lot to celebrate. Guthrie Featherston, QCMP, the suave and elegant conservative Labour MP for somewhere or another, who, when he's not passing the gas mains enabling bill or losing politely at golf to various of Her Majesty's judges, condescends to exercise his duties as head of chambers, a post to which I was due to succeed by order or seniority of barristers in practice when I was pipped at the post by young Guthrie taking silk. Well, I didn't want it anyway. Guthrie Featherston occupied the best room in chambers, and he was engaged in making a speech to our assembled members. In a corner of the room I saw our Clark Henry and Diane, the typist, in charge of a table decorated by several bottles of Jack Pomeroy's cooking champagne. I made straight for the booze, and at first Featherston's speech seemed but a background noise like Radio 4. It's well known among lawyers that the finest advocates never make the best judges. <laughs> the glory of the advocate is to be opinionated, brash, fearless, partisan, hectoring, rude, cunning, and unfair. <laughs> well done, Rumpel. This, of course, was Erskine Brown. Thank you very much, Claude. I raised my glass to him.
The ideal judge, however, Featherston babbled on, is touched, courteous, patient, painstaking, and above all, quiet. These qualities are to be found personified in the latest addition to our bench of circuit judges. Circus judges, Rumpel calls them, Uncle Tom said loudly to no one in particular. Ladies and gentlemen, the QCMP concluded, please raise your glasses to his honour, Judge George Frobisher. Everyone was smiling and drinking. So, the news had broken. George was a circuit judge. No doubt the crowds were dancing in Fleet Street. I moved to my old friend to add my word of congratulation. Your health, George. Coupled with the name of Mrs. Ida Tempest. No, Rumpo. No. George shook his head, I thought, sadly. What do you mean, no? Mrs. Tempest should be here to share in your triumph. Celebrating back at the Royal Borough Hotel, is she? She'll have the moe on ice by the time we get back. Mrs. Tempest left the Royal Borough last week, Rumpo. I have no means of knowing where to find her. At which point we were rudely interrupted by Guthrie Featherston calling on George to make a speech. Other members joined in, and Henry filled up George's glass in preparation for the great oration. I'm... Totally unprepared to say anything on this occasion, George said, taking a piece of paper from his pocket to general laughter. Poor old George could never do anything off the cuff. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, George started, I have long felt the need to retire from the hurly-burly of practice at the bar. It comes as news to me that George Frobisher had a practice at the bar, Uncle Tom said to no one, much in a deafening whisper. Uh, to escape from the benevolent despotism of Henry, now our senior clerk, George twinkled. Can you do a careless driving at Croydon tomorrow, Your Honour? Henry called out in the cheeky manner he had adopted since he was an office boy. Laughter. No, Henry, I can't. So I have long considered applying for a circuit judgeship in a rural area. Where are you going to, George? Glorious Devon, Featherston interrupted. I think they're starting me off in Luton. And I hope very soon I'll have the pleasure of you all appearing before me. And naturally, as a judge, as one, however humble, of Her Majesty's judges, certain standards will be expected of me. And I mean to try to do my best to live up to those standards, said George. That's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you all very much. There was tumultuous applause increased in volume by the cooking champagne, and George joined me in a corner of the room. Uh, George, I'm sorry uh, about Mrs. Tempest. It was your fault, Rumpel. George looked at me with an air of severe rebuke. My fault? I stood amazed. But I said nothing. Not a word. Now, you know me, George. Discretion is Rumpole's middle name. I was silent as the tomb. When I brought her to dinner with you and Hilda, she recognized you at once. Well, I said she didn't show it. Ah, well, she's a remarkable woman. I was junior counsel for her former husband. I'm sure he led her on. She made an excellent impression, George, in the witness box. I tried to sound comforting. She made an excellent impression on me, Rumpel. She thought that you would be bound to tell me. She thought that. So she decided to tell me first. I stood looking at George, feeling unreasonably guilty. Somewhere in the distance, Uncle Tom was going through the usual form of words. As I remember, I had a tempest got three years, I said. Yes, said George. Her former husband got seven. I was trying to cheer him up. I don't believe Ida actually applied the match. All the same, Rumpel, it was a risk I didn't feel able to take. Ah, uh, you didn't notice the smell of burning, did you, George, any night in the Royal Borough Hotel? Of course not. But the Lord Chancellor's secretary 
had just told me of my appointment. It doesn't do for a judge's wife to have done three years, even with full remission. I looked at George. Was the sacrifice, I wondered, really necessary? Did you have to be a judge, George? I thought of that, of course, but I had the appointment. You know, at my age, Rumpole, it's difficult to learn any new sort of trade. I filled George's glass. Oh, drink up, George. There may be other ladies turning up at the Royal Borough Hotel. I very much doubt it, he replied. Every night when I sit at the table for one, I shall think, if only I'd never taken her to dinner at Rumpole's. Then I might never have known, don't you see? We could have been perfectly happy together. Sometimes I feel it will be difficult to forgive you, Rumpole. George said, very quietly. George, what did I do? I protested. I didn't say anything. But it wasn't true. My mere existence had been enough to deny George his happiness. At which point Uncle Tom finished his speech, and the other barristers raised their glasses to George and started to sing, for he's a jolly good fellow. I left them and went out into the silence of the temple, where I could still hear them singing. Next Saturday morning, I was acting the part of the native bearer with the vim basket, following she who must be obeyed through the supermarket undergrowth on our ritual shopping expedition. They've never made George Frobisher a judge. My wife seemed to feel it an occasion for ridicule and contempt. In my view, an excellent appointment, I said. I should expect to have a good record of acquittals in the Luton Crown Court. When are they going to make you a judge, Rumpel? Oh, don't ask silly questions. I'd start every sentence with, There, but for the grace of God, goes Horace Rumpel. Oh, I can imagine what she's feeling like, Hilda sniffed. She? The cat that swallowed the cream. Her honour, Mrs. Judge, Mrs. Ida Tempest. I think she's quite the thing, I'll be bound. No, she's gone, I said. Gone, Rumpel? What did George say about that? Cried and the world cried too. Ours the treasure. Suddenly, as rare things will, she vanished. We climbed on a bus, heavily laden, back to Casa Rumpel. George is well out of it. He wants my opinion. Oh, well, I don't think he does. What? Want your opinion. Later, in our kitchen, as she stored the vim away under the sink, and I prepared our Saturday morning G&T, a thought occurred to me. Do you know, I'm not sure I should have taken up as a lawyer. Whatever do you mean? Or perhaps I should have taken up as a vicar. Rumpole, have you been getting at the gin already? Faith, not facts, is what we need, do you think? Hilda was busy unpacking the saucepan scars. Perhaps she didn't quite get my drift. George Frobisher has always been a bad influence. Keep me out drinking, she said. Let's hope I'll be seeing more of you now he's been made a judge. I'd never have to know all these facts about people if I hadn't set up as a lawyer. Of course you should have been a lawyer, Rumpel. Why, exactly? Well, if you hadn't set up as a lawyer, if you hadn't gone into Daddy's chambers, you'd never have met me, Rumpel. I looked at her, suddenly seeing great vistas of what my life might have been. That's true, I said. Damn it, that's very true. Uh, put a gumption away for me, will you, Rumpo? She who must be obeyed. Of course, I did. Rumpo and the Age for Retirement Sir Matthew told the Police Federation that the work of crime detection was becoming more and more frustrating. And when you catch them, he said, there's always some clever dick of a bent barrister who earns his living by finding a legal loophole for the crook to wriggle through. The wireless set in the kitchen at Casa Rumpo, where I was moodily chewing a slice of burnt toast and drinking a cup of instant before setting off for the Ludgate Circus Palais de Justice, crackled with indignation. 
And as I went for the ancient hat and well-used Macintosh, I heard that Sir Matthew had regretted, as he called it, the recent serious epidemic of acquittals at the Old Bailey, which was a glaring example of the injustice caused by underworld legal vultures. Oh dear, and a very big oh dear at that. Rumpole's occupation, that of making sure that citizens of all classes are not randomly convicted of crimes they didn't do, just so that the prison statistics may look more impressive, seems to have fallen into disrepute. I felt more than usually unappreciated as I burrowed down the Gloucester Road tube on my mole-like journey to irritate the constabulary and pour sand in the gearbox of justice, and when I emerged, blinking into the daylight of the temple station, I was beginning to wonder if it were not time to abandon the uphill struggle. Was it possible that Rumpole should retire from the bar? Of course, I have nothing to retire on, except an overdraft at the National Westminster Bank and a dribble of uncollected fees. But now my son Nick has gone off to seek a newer world, being something pretty high up in the University of Baltimore's sociology department, and living with his wife Erica in some luxurious ranch-style edifice with a swimming pool in what my daughter-in-law mysteriously refers to as the backyard. I always thought of a backyard as a place for dustbins, bicycles, and possibly a cage for ferrets. Hilda and I are more or less alone in the world. It little profits that an idle king, I quoted to myself as I climbed into the frayed black gown and crowned myself with the antique wig, and poor old Alfred Tennyson's words seemed more than usually apposite. By this still hearth among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and feed and sleep, and know not me. I recall the poor old laureate's words again that day when, delivered of my final speech in a case where I was defending a certain Melvin Glassworth on a well-aimed charge of conspiracy to steal various works of art and valuable antiques, I sat in number three court at the Old Bailey listening to the summing up of that singularly unattractive judge, Mr. Justice Vosper. Just as a gambler at Monte Carlo may be bankrupted by a long run on the black, when all his savings are staked on the red, so I had suffered the misfortune of facing Vosper J. in three cases running at the Bailey. This judge, who in my considered opinion has a great deal in common with Shakespeare's Angelo, they both urinate congealed ice, suffered all the worst faults of a judge. He was unable to keep quiet. He invariably acted as leading counsel for the prosecution, and he could never resist trying to make a joke instead of leaving the comedy to Rumpel. Anyway, there we sat, counsel for the prosecution relaxed, the jury looking young and serious. They had all no doubt heard the wise words of the head copper on the wireless that morning. And Mr. Melvin Glassworth, a plumpish, pinkish man who smelt of various toilet preparations, sweated slightly in the dock as he saw the doors of the prison house begin to close. I shut my eyes and from afar became aware that the words now falling from his lordship might be construed as discouraging Rumpel's continued activity about the courts of justice. Finally, members of the jury... Allow me to remind you, said his lordship, you decide this case on the facts and not on the speeches of counsel, however eloquently they address you. In other words, his message was, beware of Rumpel, the old Bailey hack. Counsel for the defense in this case, the judge went on, has chosen not to challenge the police evidence, as he is entitled to do. But you are entitled to form your own view of the evidence, quite independent of the view of learned counsel, however long he may have been practicing at the bar. 
Oh, why didn't he just tell them Rumpel's past it? Oh, we all enjoy Rumpel's speeches. We always find his little jokes most amusing. But you and I have a more serious duty to perform. I knew he was delighted that I was only there to provide light relief. Bring on the dancing Rumpel. Of course, if by any chance you think there is a reasonable doubt in this case, you will follow Mr. Rumpel's advice and acquit the defendant Glassworth of this serious charge of conspiracy to steal these valuable works of art. Here yeah, his lordship smiled tolerantly at the jury, in the full knowledge that they would agree that this was a truly laughable suggestion. Uh, but if you think that the prosecution case is unanswerable, in other words, Vosper J was saying, if you have an ounce of common sense, then it is your plain duty, in accordance with your oath, to find the defendant guilty as charged, and bugger rumpled, he might have added. So will you please go now and consider your verdict? The only question for you is whether Melvin Glassworth is guilty as charged. Mr. Jury Bailiff? Whereupon the usher rose in the well of the court, held up a Bible, and swore to take the jury to some convenient place to consider this simple question and I prayed silently that they would consider the feelings of an old man and stay out for a decent interval, or at least more than five minutes. Meanwhile, I went out into the corridor, lit a small cigar with the nervous hand and the dry mouth I always experience when the jury goes out to consider its verdict, and was immediately accosted by a bulky man of about my own age, wearing a lightweight checked summer sports jacket who addressed me in a low, rumbling, transatlantic accent. Mr. Rumpel, he said, I've heard a lot about you, sir. Your fame has spread to the States. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, yes, sir. You know I practiced as an attorney myself for many years. Oh, of course, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't wear the rug. I thought he must be referring to some sort of plaid, perhaps for use in cold courts, and I was confused. The what? The, uh, the headpiece, the uh, horsehair peruke. Oh, ho, ho, this! I slapped my antique wig. Oh, of course, we're invisible without it. Unless we've got it on, the judge can't see us. Sometimes I'm tempted to remove the wig and disappear entirely from view. I can understand, sir, exactly how you feel. The voice was sympathetic. The learned judge seemed to regard you somewhat as a senior citizen. I'm not all that senior. I was defensive. And he's not all that learned. I long ago gave up the dust of conflict for the groves of academe. What do you call an academic lawyer here? As bad language is not encouraged from members of my learned profession round the belly, I didn't tell him. In the ensuing silence, he pulled out his wallet and presented me with an embossed card. Professor Kramer, head of the Department of Law, it announced, in the University of Baltimore. Baltimore, my son's university! But the usher came bustling up to put an end to further inquiry. Uh, Mr. Rumpel, he said urgently, they're coming back, Mr. Rumpel. How extremely rude of them. I turned to Professor Kramer. My son, Nick's at Baltimore, teaching sociology. He's got his own small department now, and a new house. 1106 East Drive, Baltimore, do you know it? Oh, of course, Nick's the brain of the family. They've got a verdict, Mr. Rumpel, the usher interned. Um, oh, look, I've got to go now. Professor, uh, um... Kramer, Julius Kramer. I shall be in touch. Back to the dust of battle, Mr. Rumpel. I have to tell you, it's just great to be out of it. The jury came back and announced their unanimous decision. The judge announced the three-year sentence he'd been planning throughout the trial. 
and I went down to the cells to say goodbye to Mr. Melvin Glassworth. Taking a leave of a convicted client is one of those awkward social occasions which I would give anything to avoid, but which are as mandatory as an invitation to the palace. Not that I've ever had an invitation to the palace, but I have kept many disappointed engagements down the cells at the Bailey. However disastrous the result or excessive the sentence, you really get blamed for losing a case. The prisoner may be almost relieved that it wasn't as bad as he feared, and is always numb. It's only after a week in Chokey that the shock wears off, the pain starts, and the customer faces up to the reality of stone walls and banging up and stinking chamber pots and and tears, I have no doubt, start to prick behind the eyes. As I have said, you rarely get blamed. Mr. Melvin Glassworth was, however, the exception that proves the rule. When my solicitor, Mr. Bernard, and I went down to the cells, Glassworth was red-faced, sweating more than ever, and extremely angry. It was no good suggesting that three years for a theft worth at least 20,000 nicker was not outrageous. So Rumpole lit a small cigar and contented himself into looking genuinely grieved. Mr. Bernard provided cold comfort by pointing out that it was only two, really, with time off for good behaviour. Ah, oh, what's two? A long weekend in the country. Is that what you're trying to tell me? I suppose you want me to be grateful. Mr. Glassworth mopped his forehead with a purple silk handkerchief that smelt of old pear drops. I'm a man of a certain fastidiousness, he told us. I have to have two shirts a day, me. Two clean shirts is not an indulgence as far as I'm concerned. It's a necessity. Uh, do they still have slopping out? Yes, I'm afraid they do, I had to tell him. He moved away from us. I was afraid that the tears were coming now. I have spent my life in the acquisition of beautiful objects, Mr. Glassworth said. That, of course, was really the problem. Slopping out. How could I live through it, me? He went on. And the sickening sexual advances of beefy waters. Oh, I shouldn't count on that, old darling, I said. Not quite sufficiently under my breath. What did you say? Um, nothing. I'm sorry. You're sorry? You can go home. Mr. Glassworth's misery exploded in anger. Have a bath with a decent tablet of imperial leather. Dry on a warm fleecy towel. Use talcum powder and eau de toilette, you. Well, I don't, actually. Oh, but there was no real point in establishing my bathroom habits. Attacking the police. That wasn't a smash hit with the jury, was it? And those little jokes in your final speech. They didn't exactly bring the house down, did they? The judge went too far in his summing up, Melvin. We can think about an appeal. Mr. Bernard was soothing, but Melvin Glassworth turned on me, unappeased. Do you know what you ought to be thinking about, you? Retirement, he said. That's what you ought to do, bloody retire! My next appearance before Mr. Justice Vosper took place after old Uncle Percy Timpson found Jesus Christ unexpectedly in his lock-up garage. I have written elsewhere of the Timpson family, that huge clan of South London villains whose selfless devotion to crime has kept the Rumpels in such luxuries as Vim, Gumption, sliced bread, and saucepan scourers over the years. Not to mention the bare necessities of life, such as gin, tonic, and cooking claret from Pomeroy's wine bar. Uncle Percy Timpson, who lived with his wife Noreen in a respectable semi-detached somewhere in the general direction of Kent, had practised for many years the profession of a small-time fence or receiver of stolen property. The business was small, personal, and regular. It enabled Uncle Percy and Auntie Noreen to run an elderly cortina, grow prize leeks, and go for an annual holiday on the Costa Brava. 
They had, it seemed, recently been away for such a package adventure, and the morning after their return, as they sat brewing early morning tea in their kitchen, Auntie Noreen saw something which caused her to throw the fine Georgian silver teapot she was using, part of the business stock, straight into the tidy bin. When Percy joined her at the window, he said, That new one. That Detective Inspector Broom's got no bloody manners. When it was old Percy White's batch, he at least gave you time to finish your breakfast. Detective Inspector Broom, known as the new Broom among the disapproving Timpsons, was a young, zealous officer with horn-rimmed spectacles, a small but aggressive moustache, and views on lawyers which coincided entirely with those which Sir Matthew, the chief copper, had been expounding on steam radio. He was at that moment advancing remorselessly on Uncle Percy's garage, leading a posse which included Detective Constable Wood, a uniformed officer, and an Alsatian dog. At the garage doors, old Uncle Percy came out in his dressing gown and encountered the detective inspector. His conscience was easy, and his manner relaxed. So far as he knew, there was nothing of interest to be found in the garage. The load from the Deptford job went the week before, and a consignment of electric blankets was not due till the following Saturday. You're uh, interested in Barmark Banger, Mr. Broom, are you? Percy asked. One owner, he was a vicar of Gravesend. He only used it for funerals. Open up, Percy. D.C. Wood sounded distinctly hostile. Or do you want us to break the door down? We know what you've got there, Percy. We know exactly what you've got, D.I. Broom said. Nothing. I do assure you, Mr. Broom, it's not perfectly legitimate. At which, with a confidence which turned out to be ill-founded, Percy Timpson unlocked his garage. A huge religious picture which had been leaning against the door, toppled forward. Our Lord and Saviour, his hand raised in gentle benediction, was descending on the astonished onlookers. Jesus Christ, said Percy. He was more surprised than anyone. So it happened that Percy Timpson found himself in the local nick, being interviewed by those fearless battlers against crime, D.I. Broom and D.C. Wood. Broom, in the interest of making his case barrister-proof, was after Uncle Percy's autograph on a confession statement, a brief admission of the crime of receiving a religious artwork in his lock-up garage well knowing it to have been stolen. Meanwhile, Mr. Bernard, the solicitor, who shared with me the honour of being permanent legal adviser to the Timpsons, had dropped in on Noreen in answer to her almost hysterical calls a hysteria brought about by the supernatural quality of the manifestation in the garage, rather than by the everyday occurrence of Uncle Percy being taken down to the nick. Percy's got too old for it, Mr. Bernard, she told him, over a nice cup of tea from the rescued Georgian silver pot. The whole family told him. He's got too old altogether. He ought to retire. Fancy keeping Jesus in his lock-up garage. She's getting that careless. Well, not sufficiently careless, let's hope, Mrs. Timpson, to give D.I. Broom his autograph, at which point Bernard managed to get hold of the detective inspector on the phone. The answers he got were only to be expected. Mr. Broom was unable to say where Percy Timpson was being held incommunicado. All he could say was that he was not prepared to let Percy see or speak to or have any dealings with a lawyer, for the reason which seemed good enough to the D.I. that if Percy were guilty, he'd only be stopped confessing. And if he were innocent, why did he need a lawyer anyway? Having satisfactorily disposed of the legal profession, Broom returned to where Percy was sitting being fed tea and biscuits by D.C. Wood, uh, playing the sympathetic role and briskly informed him that his wife Noreen was in the cells below, about to be charged with conspiracy to receive Jesus, unless Percy at once supplied his autograph. The fact that this statement was an outrageous lie was merely one of the sacrifices the eager inspector was prepared to make in his devoted pursuit of law and order. Tell me, 
Broom speculated. Just how long is it since your old woman saw the inside of Holloway? Hm? Huh? We want a statement signed in your own words, Percy. What were his own words, exactly? Constable Wood read out the composition on which he had been working. I received the religious artwork in my garage, well knowing it to be stolen by a person whose name I am not prepared to divulge. Well, which of them was it, Percy? Which of the Timpson family was it, exactly? Broom asked. I am not prepared to divulge. Although prepared to do almost anything to save Noreen, Percy was not by nature a grass, any more than he was a signer of confessions. No doubt on the advice of his bloody lawyer, Broom commented. I was intending to dispose of this picture at the earliest opportunity, Wood read on, and Percy interrupted. Like when I went up to King's Elm Saturday and met a few of my contacts. I want that in. Like when I went up the King's Elm Saturday and met a few of my contacts, Wood read on obediently. And then the document, calculated to stop the boldest, bentest barrister dead in his tracks, was put before Uncle Percy for signature. So, when the brief arrived at my chambers, I was faced with a clearly signed confession of guilt, plus an inexplicable picture of Jesus in the garage. Apart from that little difficulty, the defence seemed moderately plain sailing. As I walked down to the temple tube station some weeks later on my way home to Casa Rumpel, I saw a large figure flitting like some bloated white moth through the twilight along the embankment. It was Julius Kramer, jogging in a tracksuit. Oh, Professor Kramer! I called out, hoping for news of my son Nick in Baltimore. Nick and I were extremely close when he was a young lad. In fact, we formed some sort of unholy alliance against the constant attacks made by she who must be obeyed on our peace and privacy. Nick would stop her growing restive if I called in at Pomeroy's for a glass of Chateau Fleet Street on my way home, and I would do my best to frustrate her attempts to send Nick to the hairdresser or the dentist or some other unwelcome destination. We used to enjoy a good walk across Hampstead Heath, during which I way Holmes and Nick... Watson, and we would search for clues. Since Nick married an American girl, a young lady who indulged herself on an extremely dangerous diet of organic vegetation and iced water, and since he took up his lectureship in sociology, I had seen little of Nick, and, to be perfectly frank, I missed his company. And that instant rapport, it seemed to me, that we had, when he was about ten years of age. Professor Kramer! I called again, but my voice was lost in the shadows, the cry of the seagulls and the roar of the traffic, and the large man trundled out of view. When I got home, I was amazed to find that she who must be obeyed not only smiled at me in a way which was clearly meant to be welcoming, but she also sat me down in front of the glowing plastic coal of our electric fire pushed a footstool towards my legs, and actually poured me a generous G&T. "'Are you tired, dear?' she asked solicitously. "'Are you feeling quite well, Hilda?' I was puzzled enough to ask. "'A day in court is so hard for a man of your age. Daddy always said it was such physical labour standing up in court.' Well, perhaps that's why your daddy always sat down so remarkably quickly, particularly if anybody raised the subject of bloodstains. He couldn't stand the mention of blood, your daddy. Look at the danger to your health, Rumpel, Hilda continued, unperturbed. Yes, I know, it's like bloody mountaineering. You take your life in your hands in the law. There's always the risk of falling down the last two steps of the gents in Pomeroy's wine bar. Anyway, Rumpel, you won't want to die in harness. You know, poor Daddy died in harness. Oh, really? I thought he died in the Tunbridge Hospital. At which point she produced a bag full of fluffy white knitting wool, and the room was filled with the unusual click of needles. Rumpel, you must take things seriously, warned the gloomy tricoteurs 
You don't want to drop dead in court. I suppose she was right. I didn't fancy the idea of pegging out in the unconcerned presence of Mr. Justice Vosper. Earl Harness may be all right, but dying in a wig. To introduce a less depressing topic, I asked she what garment she was constructing. Or was it perhaps bed socks? It's for Mrs. Erskine Brown's baby. Your Miss Philida Chant, as was, that nice girl in your chambers. She'll have to give up the bar now she's got the baby. Uh, birth and death, they silenced us all in the end. What are you knitting for it, a dust sheet? No, a matinee jacket. Oh, I forgot, it's a letter for you. Will the baby go to many matinees, I asked, but it didn't get a laugh. Instead, she handed me the letter, which announced that it came from the desk of Professor Julius Kramer of Baltimore University, and continued, Dear Mr. Rumpole, your name has long been known to us as a legal luminary. We would wish to invite you, and of course your good lady, to visit us on campus during the autumn semester and deliver a series of lectures on the alienation factor in the psychological aspects of owner deprivation. What does that mean, Rumpel? Owner deprivation? Presumably nicking things. It's from Baltimore University, Hilda reminded me quite unnecessarily. Nick's university? What a coincidence! There was a further coincidence. Later that evening, the phone rang, and my son Nick's voice came to me, not frozen by the Atlantic breakers, but clear as a bell. He was flying over to England, it seemed, on university business, and would stay with us. I was, of course, delighted. It was going to be like the old days, when he came up for half-term and visited the old Bailey to listen to one of my murders. Always so much more suitable, I thought, than the cinema. He would come and watch my performance in court. I'd give him lunch. Yeah, life was distinctly improving. The prosecution of Uncle Percy Timpson was in the hands of that recent father and married man, Claude Erskine Brown. As we gathered outside court number two in the Old Bailey, my heart sank. Once again, the wheel of fortune had spun and turned up a disaster for the gambler Rumpel. The case was to be tried by Mr. Justice Vosper. As I stood reeling under this blow, Erskine Brown came bustling up and showed me the photograph of a somewhat elderly-looking baby. In fact, it looked even older than I felt. It's an extraordinarily talented baby for its age, Erskine Brown boasted. It has an amazingly powerful grip. Yes, well, that'll be for hanging on to its mother's tail as they spring from bow to bow, I said, forgetting at the moment that the mother was one of my learned friends. Erskine Brown put away the photograph reluctantly. I think it has a remarkably intelligent look. I can't get Philly to see it. Yes, quite remarkable. Any day now it should be picking up a few briefs in the Chancery Division, I assured him. Oh, Rumpel, you're not being serious. Perfectly serious. With an expression like that, we might find it a place on the circuit bench. I shouldn't be at all surprised. Erskine Brown looked at a bench load of stolid, well-fed and dishonest citizens, the Timpson family, who had come to lend comfort and support to their Uncle Percy. I recognized Noreen and such old clients as Fred, Dennis, Cyril, and Fred's wife, Vi Timpson. The men were smartly dressed in blazers and flannels. The women had elaborate perms. Are those all your witnesses? Erskine Brown asked, as the clan Timpson gave me warm smiles of encouragement. Oh, no, my client's family. They're the sort to breed from the Timpsons. Their activities have kept me in work for years. This, uh, this isn't a fight, is it? Erskine Brown asked as we moved into court. Oh, my dear Erskine Brown, Claude. Well, shall we say just a little skirmish. Uh, but the picture was in your garage, and you signed a confession. Yes, that means I start with a considerable handicap. 
which is probably fair, considering the difference in our form. I told him that with an optimism I hardly felt. Erskine Brown looked disappointed. I was hoping for a quick plea. You see, I rather like to get back in time for the afternoon feed. Oh, really? You indulge in a high tea, Erskine Brown? Oh, no, not my feed, the baby's. Among the prosecution witnesses, Erskine Brown called Mr. Rowland, a man with a bald, skull-like head, who was, it seemed, an art expert. Uh, I would say that work is quite priceless, Rowland told Erskine Brown, pointing to the picture in the well of the court. But if you had to name a figure, how can you put a price on beauty? The deaths had appealed to the allegedly learned judge. It has been done in the past, Mr. Rowland, by some quite well-known ladies. Oh, dear, we were all most amused by his lordship's little jokes. There was obedient laughter in court. Oh, then, uh, shall we say a quarter of a million? Mr. Rowland dropped his bombshell, turning poor old Uncle Percy, the small-time fence, into a major criminal. Uh, pounds, not dollars. Uncle Percy looked about to faint dead away, and the rest of the Timpsons were still whistling under their breath as I rose to cross-examine. Uh, Mr. Rowland, you say that this is an undoubted painting by Taddeo di Bartolo. I waved in a casual manner at Our Lord, which had been made Exhibit One. A nicknamed Il Zoppo, the lame one. I gave him back his learning. A Sienese master of the 14th century. Uh, the Quattrocento. The Quattrocento, I'm obliged. And it is a good example of the master's work. I would say an excellent example. Mr. Rowland gave me what might have been a smile, had it appeared on a living face. Il Zoppo, the lame one. Is he a painter well known to the general public? I asked politely. Oh, he is extremely well known to connoisseurs. Oh, I'm sure he is. I, I just wondered if his work was instantly recognisable uh, by the crowd who get in the King's Elm on a Saturday night. Uh, oh, my lord! Erskine Brown had risen to his hind legs, protesting. I ignored him. Well, what's the answer? Uh, I should imagine uh, probably not. And, I went on at increased volume to drown any interruption, any drinker in the saloon bar who did recognize Il Zoppo's work and wanted to buy it would have to be provided with a half a million pounds in his hip pocket to complete the transaction, hmm? Uh, my lord, I really don't know what the relevance of these questions is, Erskine Brown bleated and then sat down exhausted. I picked up Uncle Percy's signed confession and looked at it in disgust. The relevance, my lord, is that in his so-called voluntary statement, Mr. Timpson said he proposed to flog the artwork up the King's Elm next Saturday night. Even judicial knowledge, my lord, must encompass the fact that the king's elm is not Sotheby's. The judge, however, gave me a brisk return. And even your extensive knowledge of crime, Mr. Rumpo, he said, must encompass the possibility that your client himself had no idea of how valuable the pen he was. So, when the score at fifteen all, a small diversion was caused by Henry bringing my son Nick Rumpel into court and finding him a seat behind me. Nick had arrived the night before and gone to bed before we had more than a couple of jars, a short chat and some coloured slides of his lovely home, his wife Erica, the swimming pool, and a number of visiting academics cooking a meal on some sort of open fire, although I assumed the house had a reasonably equipped kitchen. Nick had kept his promise to come down to the Bailey for a morning's entertainment and a spot of lunch, and I thought, as I turned to look at him, how extraordinary it was that he was so large. I always think of Nick as a solemn boy in a school blazer, sitting in silent fascination in the back row of a murder. However, I was resolved to give my son an entertaining day at the Bailey, 
and I entered with enthusiasm into the mano e mano with Detective Inspector Broom. I was asking the officer about the call he had had from Mr. Bernard, my instructing solicitor. He smiled tolerantly at the jury, as if to warn them that we were now coming to the suspect evidence of bent lawyers, and lied effectively. Uh, Mr. Bernard did not ring me, he said. Mr. Bernard will say that he did. Huh, I expect he will. A nudge, nudge, wink, wink at the jury. And that he was denied access to his client. Oh, does he say that? Broom sounded bored. You told him that Percy Timpson couldn't see a solicitor? Uh, no. Would you have allowed Percy Timpson to see a solicitor at the time this precious document was signed? No, I would not. I turned and gave Nick a quick smile and got his nod of approval. Then I re-attacked the witness. So if Mr. Bernard had telephoned, he would have been refused access? Yes. Why? No doubt you are still making your inquiries, were you not, Inspector? Mr. Justice Vosper supplied the answer. Uh, that is so, my lord, said Broom. Can you explain, officer, why Mr. Percy Timpson should have signed this confession in the absence of his solicitor? I don't know, Mr. Rumpel. People sometimes tell the truth. Broom was delighted by his answer. In the absence of their solicitor. And people sometimes want to protect their wives, don't they, Inspector? Oh, I suppose they may. The D.I. sounded less happy. You know my client has been married to his wife, Noreen, for almost thirty years. Are you putting your client forward as a perfect husband, Mr. Rumpo? The judge weighed in, no doubt sensing danger. No, my lord, merely as a loving husband. This shut his lordship up for a moment, and I turned to the witness. Did you tell Percy Timpson that you had his wife downstairs in the station? Ah, oh, it's possible I can't remember. I do have other cases, you know, Mr. Rumpel. The witness answered carelessly. Did you say she was in the station? I pressed him. Oh, I may have done. Why did you lie to my client, Inspector? I didn't lie to him. The bizarre suggestion that police officers are ever less than a hundred percent truthful appeared to have disconcerted the witness. Why did you tell him that Noreen had been brought into the station and charged? Uh, I expect I said it because I intended to do exactly that, Broom said, as though that explained everything. You intended to charge her? Yes. Why did you change your mind? What? Oh, you never did charge her, did you? Well, there was no need to after... No, no need to after Percy had signed his statement. Is that what you mean? I saw the jury look at Broom as if some of them were beginning to doubt the doctrine of the infallibility of the police. Uh, no need to after that, no, Broom admitted. After he'd fallen into your trap, the bait could be thrown away. You'd got what you wanted, hadn't you? What had I wanted? The defensive position didn't suit D.I. Broom. An untrue confession, signed in the hope of saving his wife from the unwelcoming gates of Holloway Prison. It was clearly the moment for his lordship to come to the prosecution's rescue, and he did so with some skill. Uh, Mr. Rumpel, the politeness from the bench was icy. Uh, yes, my lord. Aren't you forgetting something? This admirable example of Italian Renaissance art was actually found in your client's garage. Isn't that the point? At which he gave the jury a meaningful look. Yes, members of the jury, shall we say five past two? Well, isn't that the point, Dad? Nick and I were enjoying a sustaining steak pie with boiled cabbage washed down with a pint of draught Guinness in the pub opposite the belly. On a corner table, the Timpson men were consuming brown ales and buying snowballs for their ladies, and in the middle distance the officers in charge of the case were scoffing harp lagers and cold sausage. But I mean, if he's guilty anyway, Nick continued to cross-examine his father. If he's guilty anyway, why bother to squeeze a confession out of him? 
I looked across at the Timpson table. You see, Nick, I know the Timpson family. Their activities paid your school fees for years. They never sign confessions. Ah, you'll be able to lecture on that. Nick was laughing. Lecture? I didn't follow his drift. You met Julius Kramer. Oh, was that your doing, Nick? For the first time I got a sniff of some kind of plot. Oh, you must come to Baltimore, really. There's a lot of room in the new house. Erica would be thrilled to have you. Oh, well, if I can get away. I was doubtful. Oh, of course you can get away. You've really got to get away. Got to? Well, Ma says you've been so tired lately. Nick was looking at me, concerned. At which moment D.I. Broom was passing us on his way back to court, and he stopped for an unfriendly chat. Enjoy the pantomime, Mr. Rumpo? he asked. Is that what you call it? Well, don't you? No, I call it a trial, based on the quaint old-fashioned notion that a man's innocent until you prove him guilty. Oh, come on, sir. You know Percy Timpson's been a fence for years. On which parting shot he left. I finished my Guinness and lit a small cigar. Detective Inspector Broom, I mused. The new Broom. Trials are just an unnecessary interruption in his fearless battle against crime. Yes, but all the same, Nick sounded doubtful. All the same what, Nick? Well, it's not as if it was one of the murders you used to take me to. I, I mean, they were serious cases. <laughs> ah, yes. You enjoyed those murders, didn't you, Nick? I mean, if Percy Timpson really is a professional fence. Oh, yes, he is quite professional. Nick looked at me. He was smiling gently. Well, then, why bother, really? He said. The Timpson case proceeded slowly. We kept having days off due to the fact that Mr. Justice Vosper was dividing his time between us and a government committee on the treatment of the young offender. Meanwhile, a deep-laid plot was going on involving my wife, Nick, and the mysterious Professor Kramer, of which I had no more than an inkling. I only learned months later that Mrs. Erskine Brown, Miss Phyllida Trant in real life, had been invited for tea in Gloucester Road, had gone there, received the matinee jacket on behalf of the baby, and had been involved in the following conversation concerning the future of Rumpel. I really wonder you had time to come home to tea, Hilda began obliquely. What with the baby? Oh, I had a day off court, so Claude's holding the fort. Actually, he enjoys it. Rumpel's not having a day off. He's gone for a conference in Wandsworth. Well, he's doing far too much for a man of his age. He looks tired, Nick told Philida. Don't you think so? Oh, I think he looks... Well, just as usual. He's desperately tired. We just can't wait to get him away. Get Rumpel away? Where to exactly? America. I want them both to come and live with me in Baltimore, Nick said. You want Rumpel to give up the bar? Mrs. Erskine Brown was astonished. Well, to retire. Everyone retires, don't they? Oh, everyone, possibly, but Rumpel! Clearly, Chambers had never considered the possibility. He's not immortal, you know. Rumpel's hardly immortal. Anyway, not a word to him at the moment. We're luring him across the herring pond by an offer of lectures in Nick's university, Hilda told her. I've got him an offer from one of our professors, said Nick. He's going to lecture on law. Nick revealed the full details of the plot. Rumpel on law? Apparently my learned friend Miss Trant sounded incredulous. Well, really, Miss Trant, surely he knows about the law. Hilda bridled a little. The way Mrs. Erskine Brown answered her wasn't entirely flattering, but no doubt it contained a certain amount of truth. Oh, hardly anything. Oh, he could lecture on how to tear up paper in the prosecution speech, or how to trick his opponent into boring the court with a lot of unnecessary cases. That's the one he played on me when I first started. 
He knows all about how to cross-examine and which members of the jury to get on his side. But if you ask my honest opinion, Rumpel doesn't know anything about the law. Oh, but it's only the bait for getting him over. And I put this flat on the market. So, we'll have a little money, and living with Nick. Hilda seemed to see no problems. I'm sure once he sees the house, he'll stay, Nick said. Nick has a swimming pool, he was telling me, and a sort of campfire. Barbecue, mother. Oh, is Rumpel tremendously keen on swimming? Their visitor was doubtful. Well, if you ask me, he's bored to tears with the sort of cases he's doing nowadays. Nick seemed to have no doubt about the matter. An obvious receiver? And the defence is, he didn't do it because he's finished the last job and was preparing for the next. Now, how could that interest anybody? Oh, I'm not sure. Miss Trance, as was, knew me. I'm sad to say, perhaps better than my son. Oh, Dad's in a hopeless position with the judge and the police dead against him. Oh, are they? Oh, well then. I know exactly how he's feeling. Yes, pretty depressed, I imagine. Nick supplied his answer, but the lady lawyer had hers. I should think by now he's just starting to have fun. The conversation at that tea-time was, as I say, unknown to me for many months, and unconscious of my consignment by my nearest and dearest to the scrap-heap of rusty and worn-out barristers, I was, in fact, having a certain amount of quiet pleasure in pursuing a line of inquiry with that well-known expert on stolen art treasures, Mr. Melvin Glassworth, whom I had gone to visit in Wandsworth, ostensibly to discuss the matter of his appeal. Screws treating you all right, are they? I asked him as we met among the pot plants of the prison interview room and offered him a small cigar. Oh, some of them are rather sweet. But you've got to get me out of here, Mr. Rumpel. I'm sorry I was a bit irritable last time. Well, I'd be a bit irritable if I'd just got three years, I assured him. You can get me out, Mr. Rumpel. I know you can. I have been considering your appeal. I started judicially. Oh, I hope to God you've come up with a few bright ideas. I have found at least ten places in which the judge misdirected the jury as to our defence. Oh, then you'll tell the Court of Appeal for me. You will, won't you, Mr. Rumpel? I may not be able to take your case on, Mr. Glassworth. I sound a doubtful pressure of other work. But if you found ten good points, well, he's duty-bound, isn't he, Mr. Bernard? The plump man, paler but no thinner since his conviction, looked appealingly at my instructing solicitor. I'll have to see. I paused and then said casually, Meanwhile, perhaps you can help me as an expert in stolen artworks. An expert? Me? Well, I suppose I am. What do you want to know? A very valuable painting might be too well known to dispose of, I made a guess. Oh, you get that trouble, yes. Yes, it's hopeless trying to flog a Goya, for instance. Or a Taddeo di Bartolo, nicknamed Il Zoppo, I inquired casually. Ah, oh, they're never charging me with that one, are they, Mr. Rumpel? Me? Mr. Glassworth was appalled. Uh, not as yet. I looked at him speculatively. What would you do if you had a well-known Di Bartolo? The benediction, for instance. Oh, well, you'd never sell it. Too well-known. No, I agree. But what would you do? You mean, what would whoever had purloined such an artwork do, Mr. Rampel? My art expert was cautious. Yes, exactly. Dump it. Melvin Glassworth had no hesitation. Really? Oh, the only thing to do with it, of course. Oh, it might pay you to let the insurance company know where it got left. Dump it, I wondered. In what sort of place, exactly? Oh, somewhere anonymous, I suppose. Somewhere, somewhere that couldn't be connected with you. Municipal rubbish tip? Has that ever been used? Oh, it has been known. 
Look about this appeal. Bloody impossible in here. Can't get a decent shampoo. I wash my hair daily, me. I promised to deal with his appeal. He had given me a little help with Percy Timpson's case, but I got a lot more assistance when I was met at the prison gates by Mrs. Vi Timpson, on her way to pay a family visit to her brother Charlie, who had just got two years for carrying housebreaking implements by night. Vi said she wanted an urgent word in my ear in private, so I sent Bernard walking up the road and withdrew with her to a corner of the prison wall. I'll never forget, Mr. Rampower, she started. How you got my young Jim out of that nasty robbery at the butcher's? Oh, yes, yes, of course. How is Jim? Oh, doing very well, Mr. Rampole. Oh, yes, thank you. He's got his own little window-cleaning firm now. Oh, dear, I'm sorry to hear it. Window-cleaning is, of course, the best way to reconnoiter promising felonious entries. The thing is, I want to tell you, I burst out. I never agreed with what the family done to Uncle Percy. What the family did? I frowned, bewildered. Poor old Auntie Noreen. She's at the wall about it. it. Wasn't all the family, exactly. It was Dennis, mainly. You know Den was hopping mad when Percy let all that rubber back carpet go for twenty pounds. The words were rushing out of her. I put a calming hand on her arm. Mrs. Timpson, why? Perhaps you'd better tell me all about it. The family plot, or put Rumpole up to grass movement, gathered impetus in the next few days. Mrs. Erskine Brown, the baby's mother, told Erskine Brown, the father, presumably when they met briefly over the dried milk tin, that Rumpole was on the verge of retirement. Erskine Brown told Guthrie Featherston, QCMP, and our learned head of chambers met Mr. Justice Vosper, who was having a drink with his tall, lanky, and singularly unattractive son Simon in their club, the Sheridan. What had happened then was also something I did not discover until much later. Uh, Simon's just finishing his pupillage, the judge told Featherston. Uh, naturally, he's looking for seated chambers, aren't you, Simon? Uh, yes, Daddy, said Master Vosper, whose legal experience consisted in sitting next to his father on the bench and industriously sharpening his pencils. Uh, there might be a vacancy, Judge. Featherston was anxious to help. Apparently, Rumpel's retiring. He's going to live with his son in America. Rumpel retiring? The judge thought this scheme over, and so Featherston told me later approved of it. Can't be too soon for me. I've got him before me at the moment. Rumpole simply hogs the limelight. Hopeless case. Oh, but you can't stop the fellow fighting. Whilst Featherston was selling my birthright to Master Simon Vosper in the Sheridan Club, I was entertaining the Timpson family. All except Noreen, who had gone to deliver a clean shirt and an ounce of golden bar to Percy in the cells. A to tea in the cafe opposite the Old Bailey. As Vi sorted out beverages, I called the meeting to order. I wanted to discuss with you, as members of the family, I said, your Uncle Percy Timpson's defence. Yes, Mr. Rumpo. Has that got two lumps, dear? Fred was pleasantly cooperative. Well... We rely on you, Mr. Rumpole, Cyril smiled. Ah, oh, the Timpson family has always been able to rely on Mr. Rumpole, Dennis assured me. Yes, but can Mr. Rumpole rely on the Timpson family? Uh, mine's the lemon tea, by, Dennis said, and asked me, uh, What do you mean exactly, Mr. Rumpole? Well, as you well know, I explained, half a million nicker, and artworks from the Italian Quattrocento are quite out of Uncle Percy's league. Uh, therefore, I shall have to put him into the witness box to explain exactly what his league is. Oh, what do you mean, Mr. Rumpo? For the first time, Fred Timpson sounded uneasy. I mean, I warned them, Percy is going to tell the judge he disposed of 40,000 Green Shield stamps for you, Fred. 
and a couple of lorry loads of nylon tights for use and innumerable canteens of cutlery, and twenty-five yards of rubber-back carpet from the local Odeon for Dennis, as well as the electric blankets and the three freezer loads of stolen scampi. I ain't got no convictions, Dennis protested, breaking the appalled silence, and he had the grace to add, Oh, thanks to you, Mr. Rumpo. Oh, yes, I said. And I understand you've even got a legitimate job now, Dennis. What is it? Uh, Den's a crane driver, Cyril said, on the uh, municipal muck heap. On the municipal muck heap. Now, isn't that a coincidence? I looked round the embarrassed family. What do you mean, Mr. Rumpo? I mean that it was on a municipal muck heap that some far more cultivated villain than any of you dumped the benediction by Taddeo di Bartolo. Uncle Percy hasn't been doing too well as a fence lately, has he? Uh, not too brilliant, no, Freddy admitted. Percy's past it. It was Dennis who said it. Getting past it. I gave it to him then. Oh, I know. Letting your hard-won consignment of electric blankets go half price. Gossiping away in pubs when some minor grass is listening. He got our lad Jim six months chattering away like that, Mr. Rumpole. Fred was deeply hurt. Silly old fool, said Cyril. He's a menace to everyone, is Uncle Percy. Dennis pronounced judgment. Is that why you decided he ought to be retired, I asked them, and was answered by a nasty silence. You decided to put Uncle Percy out to grass, I went on. Give him his cards. Rusticate him. Put him on the shelf. You all decided Uncle Percy was past it, didn't you, the whole family? So you wanted him to retire. Quickly. There was another lengthy and guilty pause. Then Fred Timpson made an admission. Uh, we couldn't persuade Percy it was time to go, Mr. Rappel. Honest, he wouldn't listen to reason, Dennis protested. The man was bloody dangerous carrying on at his age, Cyril told me. I gave them all a cold look and told them. So Den, with the clean record, plants a picture on him and rings up D.I. Broom with the information. Hardly a golden handshake, was it? Not even a gold watch from the company. The trouble with all of you is, you're none of you Bernard Berenson. We're not what, Mr. Rumpel? Fred was puzzled. You're not even Lord Clark. You never studied civilization, even on the telly. You couldn't tell a genuine Fra Angelico from the top of a box of biscuits. And because of your total abysmal ignorance of matters artistic, Uncle Percy's up on a half-million-pound handling and three-quarters of the way to Parkhurst style of white. Well... What are you going to do about it, Mr. Rumpo? Dennis asked uncomfortably. No, what are you going to do about it, Dennis? I stood up and prepared to leave the assembled Timpsons. You'd better think a bit quickly, I told him. Uncle Percy is going to give his evidence tomorrow. By the time I got back to the flat, I was feeling low and somewhat exhausted. I sat by the electric fire alone in the dark and was roused from a blackish reverie by Nick coming in and switching on the light. It seemed that she who must be obeyed was out on a visit to the fascinating Erskine Brown baby. Nick looked at me in the way that relatives look at old people on hospital visits, with a sort of hushed concern. A bad day in court. Detective Inspector Broom, I said, wants to reverse the burden of proof. Revoke Magna Carta and abolish barristers. Well, that might be all right. If only he could resist gingering up the evidence whenever it suits him. And there's no honour among thieves any more, Nick. I'm ashamed of the Timpson family. I've always thought your job must be pretty depressing, Nick said briskly. They wanted to get poor old Uncle Percy to retire, so the family cooked up the most diabolical plot. Oh, I don't know. I really don't know what things are coming to. A drop of G&T? I shuffled off to the reviving drink stable. Yes, thanks. Things have reached a low ebb, Nick. They've even got piped music in Pomeroy's wine bar. I have to come home now to avoid the crooner. How disgusting. At which I recall the good old days when Nick was about ten. 
Remember when we used to go for walks on the heath, Nick? I was Holmes and you were Watson. We used to pick up clues. Nick took his G&T, smiled and entered into the spirit of the thing. What's the explanation of this half-used box of matches on the path, Holmes? He said in his Watson voice. Someone's either got a hole in his jacket pocket or he suddenly gave up smoking. You amaze me, Holmes. Ah, oh, you can't go for a walk up on the heath now, I told him. Not a decent Sherlock Holmes voyage of exploration. You keep tripping over the permissive society. I'll never forget those walks. It doesn't matter. We don't see so much of each other now, Nick. Doesn't matter in the least. Bound to happen anyway. People growing up and all that sort of thing. Well, perhaps we can do something about it, he said. Growing up? No, not seeing each other. Look, honestly, Nick protested, haven't you got into a terrible rut? Uh, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race, I started off. And my son, God bless him, was on to Alfred Lord Tennyson like a terrier. "'Tis not too late to seek a new world,' said Nick. "'Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows.' "'You remember it, Nick?' I was delighted, and stood up in a determined manner. "'For my purpose holds,' I carried on, "'to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die.' "'You are going to, aren't you?' Nick asked. "'Die?' I said. "'Of course not!' "'Sail beyond the sunset. You're coming to Baltimore.' Uh, "'It's a long way from the old Bailey,' I sounded doubtful. "'Well, wouldn't that be a relief?' "'Perhaps it might be. "'Well, it's still on, you know, the lectures.' "'Ah, oh, yes, yes, the lectures. "'I saw Professor Kramer today. "'The only trouble is he's no longer at the Savoy. "'They've taken him into the Charing Cross Hospital.' "'Nick broke the news to me as a matter of some seriousness. "'He collapsed while jogging.' Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. While jogging, eh? Well, I've always avoided exercise. I tried to look serious also. Exercise is simply an invitation to death. When I turned up at the Bailey next day, I saw Guthrie Featherston, QCMP, robed for the court next door, in earnest conversation with my opponent, Claude, the family man. As I drew alongside, Featherston broke off and looked, I thought, exceedingly shifty. "'Morning, Erskine Brown,' I said. "'Ready for the battle? I think we may have a little surprise for you today.' "'Ah, uh, Horace, uh, are you free by any chance next Thursday evening?' Featherston asked, in a casual sort of manner. "'Free? I don't suppose so. I'll probably be at home with my wife.' Uh, we want Hilda to come, too, and your son, of course. I believe he's over. Come where? I was puzzled. I'm giving a little dinner at the club, Featherston said. The Sheridan. Most of the chambers will be there. Pencil it in now, like a good chap. He went, and I turned to Erskine Brown for clarification. What's the matter with our learned head of chambers, I asked him. Is he coming to money? A couple of hours later, that doughty advocate Claude Erskine Brown was cross-examining Dennis Timpson, who had just given evidence on behalf of the defence. Oh, let me get this clear, Erskine Brown asked with some scorn. You found the picture on the municipal rubbish dump? Uh, where I work, yes. Dennis smiled at the jury, who were looking in turn at the exhibited depiction of our saviour giving a half-million pound benediction. And you put it in your Uncle Percy's garage? Oh, I had a key. Percy lent me his cortina when I went on holiday, Dennis explained patiently. You put it there at night, without telling your uncle what you'd done? Well, I did it quietly, like, not wanting to wake the old couple. Well, why store it in Uncle Percy's garage? Well, I didn't have no accommodation, did I? Not for a thing of that size, at home. Mr. Timson asked the exasperated Erskine Brown, "'Can you think of one reason why the members of the jury should believe this extraordinary story?' "'Yeah,' Dennis turned to the jury in a businesslike way. "'You see, members of the jury, I, I rang the local Nick that night. "'I said there was this picture light, and if they were interested, "'they could find it in Uncle Percy's carriage. "'Sir, so they was there next morning with a dawn patrol.' 
Erskine Brown sat down on this, and I saw him speaking to Henry, who had just come into court. I rose to re-examine with confidence. D.I. Broom had clearly been told by someone that there was something interesting in Percy's garage, and that informant was now revealed as Den. Who did you speak to at the local Nick? I asked. I spoke to D.I. Broom. He'll tell you that. We shall see if the prosecution recalls him to deny it. From the whispers from the officers in charge of the case, it seemed unlikely that they would. You told the detective inspector the picture was in your uncle's garage? Of course I did. But you never told your uncle. He remained in ignorance. Total ignorance, my lord, Dennis told the judge without hesitation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Timpson. Unless your lordship has any further questions. The jury was out for four hours and acquitted Percy Timpson by a majority. He went back to work to the great satisfaction of Noreen and the resigned regret of the rest of the family. On the following Thursday, I duly turned up with my wife and son at feeding time at the Sheridan Club. We penetrated the somewhat chilly portals, passed a somnolent and sleepy uniformed figure in a glass case, and went up a staircase to a fire-warmed hall, where I was delighted to see my old friend George Frobisher, now a circuit judge, and less delighted to see Mr. Justice Vosper and his lanky son Simon. I did my best to ignore the High Court judge, and greeted the inferior tribunal, his honour Judge Frobisher. George, my old friend, my dear old friend, you've come all the way from Hertfordshire. I was touched. To have dinner in your honour, Rumpel, of course I have. George smiled. I thought he was pleased to see me. Ah, I miss you at Pomeroy's, George. No friendly jar there when the day's work is over. I sat down for a moment on a nearby and inviting settee. Ah, that's the drawback of being a circuit judge, Rumpel. The work's over at tea time. You're not even allowed to go to the pub. I say, Rumpel, you're not a member here, are you? Mr. Justice Vosper always had to have his two pennyworth. Uh, no, Judge, I don't believe I am. Well, you're sitting on a member's sofa. I suppose you plead ignorance? No, Judge, I plead exhaustion. But I had to move when an elderly waitress appeared and told us that Mr. Featherstone was receiving his guests in the small dining room. So George and the Rumpel family set off in the direction she indicated and arrived in a room hung with pictures of old actors, judges, and best-selling novelists, and found a table lit by candles and gleaming with old silver, with Guthrie Featherston and all the other members of Chambers, including Henry and Diane from the clerk's room, chattering merrily and drinking sherry. I was surprised that my entrance produced a sort of awed silence. Then Guthrie Featherston stepped forward with a welcoming... Rumpel! Here he is, the guest of honour, said Erskine Brown. Rumpel of the Bailey, his wife chimed in. Rumpel, my dear fellow, Mrs. Rumpel and Nick, delighted you could come. Featherston did the honours and I heard Uncle Tom, our oldest inhabitant and non-practicing barrister, whisper to Erskine Brown, Are we feeding the entire Rumpel family? What is this, a wedding or a wake? I asked the world at large, and then moved towards the smiling Erskine Browns. The baby's left home, has it? It's actually in its caricot with the lady downstairs, our Portia told me, and the proud father added, uh, one of us will have to leave early to give it its ten o'clock feed. One of us? I thought that his wife was looking at him in a meaningful manner. I also thought it was time to get off the nappy chat, so I said cheerfully, Well, Erskine Brown, I thoroughly enjoyed our little scrap. Oh, I suppose it's nice for you to go out on a win, Erskine Brown admitted grudgingly. Go out? Go out where? I was puzzled. Oh! You mean go out for dinner? I didn't enjoy our case much, Erskine Brown said. I find these days I really prefer paperwork at home. Keeps one with the family. And I love court, his wife was enthusiastic. 
Of course, now there'll be such a lot of crime going spare in chambers. Oh, really, I said. Are you expecting a new outbreak of villainy? Before I could fully understand Mrs. Erskine Brown's prophecy of extra work in chambers, I heard a well-known and unloved voice say, A rumple. Oh, my God. I turned at the unwelcome sound. Only our judge, Erskine Brown reassured me. What had happened was all too clear. Featherston had invited Mr. Justice Vosper and his unlikely lad to dinner. I think you know my son, Simon. He's endlessly grateful for the favour you're doing him. Aren't you grateful to Rumpole, Simon? Of course I am, Daddy. I had no idea what particular kindness, if any, I had unintentionally done young Simon Vosper. Before I could ask for further particulars, the judge rattled on. I say, that was an outrageous win you had today. Your client should have been potted. Oh, really? I'm sorry you miscued, I said. Miscued? Ha, ha! The judge laughed mirthlessly. Funny, that. You'll probably have some outrageous wins, too, Simon, as soon as you get your bottom on the Rumpel's chair. What on earth was he talking about? His son's bottom on my chair? Was Mr. Justice Vosper getting past it? Before I could inquire further, the antique waitress called us to the trough. Come along, Rumpel! Featherston called to me. I've ordered pheasants, game chips, and all the trimmings. The best that the Sheridan can offer. A couple of hours later, during which I had been speculating about a mysterious cardboard box in front of Featherston's place, the learned head of our chambers beat on a glass with the spoon and rose to his feet to address the cigar-smoking port-swilling company, who were all still present, save Erskine Brown, who had slipped away mysteriously after the pud. "'Just a few words from me,' said Featherston. "'Horace Rampell has become part of our lives in chambers.' like a valued piece of antique furniture which we see every day and only notice, perhaps, and miss when it's gone. Well, that fell into the category of things that could have been put better, but I let him carry on, seeing that he was about to open the box in front of him. But I hope, Horace, I sincerely hope that you and Mrs. Rumpel will accept this clock. As a token of our affection and respect, may it tell many happy hours in the future. As the handsome timepiece was thrust into my hands, engraved as it was with the names of all the members of chambers, including Henry and Diane, and as I fondled their gift, and as their voices were raised in asking for a speech in reply, the pieces of the jigsaw, as they say in detective stories, fell into place. I saw clearly that there had been a plot against me as ruthless and well-planned as the Timpson family scheme to dispose of Uncle Percy. I was being retired, and their clock was my parting gift. I had little time to consider the participation of my wife and son in this conspiracy. My final speech was expected of me, and I gave it. If your lordship pleases, Hilda, Nick, my friends, my old friends, this occasion has cheered me considerably. I drank port, and my audience smiled pleasantly. There have been times lately during the long hours in your lordship's court, I went on, and Vosper J. called out, Pretty long for me, Rampel. However, I ignored the interruption. Listening to the constant attacks on our profession by the police, there have been times, I must confess, when I wondered if I hadn't been getting into some sort of rut. That's exactly what I've been thinking, I heard Nick whisper to George. And then I gave them the first whiff of Tennyson. Matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race. 
that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. Members of chambers all looked at Hilda in a friendly fashion, and she smiled and said, Really, Rumpo? In such moods, I must confess, I have been tempted to chuck it all in, to retire, to go out to grass. Here I paused and looked around at them all gratefully. But your support, your affection, and above all, this very generous gift have made me change my mind. There was a moment's puzzled silence. But before they could ask a question, I had launched into the final great passage of the old laureate's Ulysses. "'Tis not too late to seek a new world," I told them. "'Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset." "'A new world," George whispered to Nick. "'Perhaps he's going after all.' "'Of course he is,' said Nick. And the baths of all the western stars, until I die, I went on, and I heard Hilda assure Mrs. Erskine Brown, is definitely going. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down, I told them. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in the old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts. It still makes a good final speech, old Rambert. This was Featherstone muttering to Mr. Justice Vosper, to which the judge replied, Goes on a bit long. Made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. I paused. There was a smatter of applause. Well, is that it? Uncle Tom asked. But I had the final clear announcement to make. This handsome timepiece will encourage me, my old friends. I told him, to forget all thoughts of surrender and retirement, and not to yield in all my future cases at the Old Bailey, London Sessions, Luton Crown, or even before the Uxbridge Magistrates. And I shall never be late. This will always get me to the court on time. I was standing, holding the clock proudly, whilst the assembled company stared at me with mingled hostility and amazement, and at last Uncle Tom spoke, to no one in particular. If Rumpel's not retiring, he said, does he really mean to hang on to our clock 